It's failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, wow, it's going to be a packed hour. Failed asylum seekers could be paid up to £3,000 to encourage them to move to Rwanda voluntarily. That's under a new scheme being drawn up by the government. I kid you not, it's not April the 1st, everybody. And Rishi Sunak had finally, last night, branded comments about Diana Abbott by Tory donor Frank Hester as racist and wrong. This is pressures mounting on the Conservatives to return the £10 million he's donated to the party. And children will no longer be prescribed puberty-blocking drugs on the NHS in England, thanks to landmark new guidance. But they'll still be able to get them in Wales and Scotland and at private clinics. It does this go far enough. All of that coming up, plenty more besides. First, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. Well, migrants who've been refused asylum in the UK will be offered up to £3,000 each to move to Rwanda under a new voluntary scheme that's being put together by the government. The plan is separate to the one by ministers to send people to the African nation and, according to The Times, has already been agreed with representatives there. Well, Labour MP Jonathan Ashworth's told Talk TV he can't believe this is a real plan that's being looked at. I mean, look, what is going on? I mean... Uh... Like, you've got to have a serious plan to go after these gangs. We're spending a fortune, not only on, or the government's proposing to send, spend a fortune, not on, only on the Rwanda scheme, but this sounds to me like they're admitting that the Rwanda scheme won't work. So they're now they're going to pay the people to go to Rwanda. So look, I think it's a shambles. Britain's economy expanded in the first month of the year, signalling that the UK is on a good path to exit recession. The economy grew by 0.2% in January, according to the Office for National Statistics. The figures will give a boost to Rishi Sunak, who pledged to get the economy growing again. But senior personal finance specialist Myron Jobson's told us the economy may be turning, but there's still a long way to go. We're still in a technical recession. We still have a long way to go. I mean, high interest rates are still weighing on people. You know, the cost of debt is is quite still quite high. And so this will kind of prevent people from, again, consuming. Uh, and this is why um, we're still in the recession. Rishi Sunak's facing calls to hand back £10 million given to the Conservative Party after he condemned comments as racist and wrong, which were reportedly made by the major Tory backer who donated the money. Frank Hester is alleged to have said Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. He's since apologised for making rude comments about the politician but refused to describe them as racist. Vladimir Putin says he's planning on sending troops and systems of destruction to Russia's border with Finland once the country completes the process of joining NATO. Overnight, Russian state television released a three-hour interview with the president to discuss nuclear war, the US election and NATO's expansion. He said from a military technical point of view, they are of course ready for nuclear war, but expressed that using such weapons is not the Kremlin's desire. The head of the London Fire Brigade says the service has now completed all of the recommendations made by the first stage of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. The brigade's invested in new kits, including drones, radios and a turntable ladder which can reach up to 23 storeys high. Andy Rose says he owes it to the survivors of the Grenfell Tower tragedy to reform the service. It's also about recognising the loss and the pain of the bereaved and the survivors and making a promise to them that this change, the change you, you, you're listening to today, is owed to them uh, and we owe it to them to keep on listening, to keep on learning, to keep on making that change. And around a million adults in the UK are still smoking menthol-flavoured cigarettes despite a nationwide ban. A study by researchers at University College London has revealed that 16% of smokers, that's one in seven, are still accessing them despite them being made illegal in 2020. 
That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Naz and Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Rain is the name of the game for many northern and western parts of England and Wales through this afternoon. Rain will be persisting there with a few heavy downpours early on and there could be some localised flooding issues. Mostly fine and bright for Scotland except for the far northwest there will be blustery showers and most of Northern Ireland will see some sunshine but cool in the north whereas across the south there will be bright or sunny spells for the east of Wales, the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England and a mild southwesterly flow will really boost those temperatures above average up to 15 degrees Celsius. Overnight that rain ban lingers across northern England, clearing from parts of Wales, but more wet weather there by the early hours of the morning. And it heads up towards parts of southern Scotland and Northern Ireland once again. For the rest of Scotland, a clear chilly night with a patchy frost. England and Wales in the south will have a milder night. And then through tomorrow, we'll continue to see that rain ban move its way further northwards towards the central belt of Scotland. The far north of Scotland staying mostly fine and sunny. Rain continuing for Northern Ireland and Northern England and sunshine and showers for England and Wales, some of them heavy and thunder and most frequent out towards the west, so eastern England mainly fine, bright and mild again. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning, welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Another quiet Wednesday morning of news, oh, of course, yes. Well, joining me to run through all of the biggest stories of the day is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Good morning to you. Good morning. I mean, phew, we yeah. had enough stories ready for the show today, yesterday, and then a whole load more dropped. And I have to say, the one that's completely blown my mind oh, isn't isn't that a Tory donor has said something racist and the Tories won't, don't want to give the money back. Um, um, it, it isn't that there's finally some sense being seen on things like uh, puberty blockers or, or even uh, making sure we actually do have the law we've been promised to quash those convictions of people uh, who were wrongly convicted in the post office scandal. It is more on the Rwanda scheme. Now that, by the way, that bill has gone through the House of Lords, 10 different amendments, totally ripping the whole scheme apart. Goes back to the House of Commons next week. But before that, it has now emerged, thanks to the Times newspaper, I mean, I can't even believe this is true. That as it's going to be so hard to actually, like, you know, get people on those planes to Rwanda, forcing them on people who have arrived here illegally on boats, not eligible to stay here, or people who've already been failed as asylum seekers, they ain't going to be allowed to stay. But they come from places like Afghanistan and Iraq. We can't send them back to those countries. We haven't got a returns agreement. Never going to get one. So what are we doing with them? We're going to pay them three thousand pounds. <laughs> to get on a plane to go and resettle your face, Benedict, uh, to resettle in, in Rwanda. We're going to pay using... Oh, whose money? Who's, uh, let me just double-check. Where does the government get its money from? Oh, oh, our money to people who've come here illegally, failed to claim asylum, they're going to be paid £3,000 of our hard-earned money yep. to go make a new life in Rwanda. I'm going to try not to say bad words, Benedict. Off to you. If, if anybody would... Actually, if you just want to go make a cup of tea whilst I just sigh <laughs> into the camera for three minutes, you can do that. You can't just, make this stuff up. Oh, I, honestly, I said well, stuff, I not the other I was word. about to say, our government continues to make it up on a, on a daily basis. It's Are almost, they having a laugh? Almost like they're not very good at politics. It, it is. If only we had some sort of polling, perhaps, to prove that that was the case. Honestly, I, I mean, we talk about Rwanda as the sort of the... The, the, the carrot and stick approach. You're trying not to incentivize people to come. Yeah. To then say, we'll basically pay the cost that you're paying to the people smugglers if you get here and you're turned yeah. down. So it's a win-win. If you, if you yeah. pay a people's, uh, people uh, trafficker to come here and you get turned down, you get your money back, plus the free flight to Rwanda. I don't understand what, who, which genius in number 10 thought, I know, will incentivize people to come Someone's and Someone's seconded asylum. from the home office, is, is, so, is yeah, yeah, so if, if you turn up and you're approved, you, uh, you get the right to live and work and the taxpayer will subsidize you. And if you get uh, declined, you will get the taxpayer to subsidize yeah. you. What a fantastic system that we have. I, mean, I, I tell you what, oh. I mean, I've genuinely have always had Rwanda, you know, you know me, I like a holiday. <laughs> I've always had Rwanda on the list because I want to go and see the gorillas. I mean, three grand more than covers the flights. I think I'm just going to turn up on a beach in Dover with a with a with a you know with a jacket you know a, a, a life jacket on and go oh hello I'm illegal I've come from make up a country <laughs> um, no paperwork just, I'll just just wait until the gorillas get wind of this they'll be turning up going well come on come on come on we hear that there's just money being given I mean, out it, <laughs> yeah genuinely it's not April the first everybody I'd love to hear your thoughts now here's the thing. 
because I'm on air, I have to keep it clean as well. I can't say all the things I was saying off air about this policy. Quite a few other stories today uh, as well uh, in, the, in the language that perhaps I would use. I would use on air, off air, very different. But I want to know your thoughts. But if you can't keep the messages clean, I can't read them out. So do your best. <laughs> it's going to be hard. Uh, but we are asking about failed asylum seekers who could be paid up to £3,000 of taxpayers' money, uh, I, your my money, to encourage them to move to Rwanda. What is your reaction? Pick yourselves off the floor. Stop choking on your cornflakes. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls the charge at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Uh, thank you very much indeed for those calls and messages in advance. Right now, I mean, I, this is not going to fly with Tory backbenchers. It ain't going to fly with most Tory voters. You're just walking back into the same trap they're in with Lee Anderson, you know, defecting to. To reform UK, aren't they, Benedict? Honestly, it's it's almost as if politicians in this country have no concept of the history of their own country. There was this thing a few hundred years ago, admittedly, called the Danegeld, when Vikings would turn up and say, "Pay us some money, and we'll go away." And the gov and the government at the time, the king, did it, and then. Lo and behold, they came back the next year and said, well, you paid us last time, so do it. There is no actual benefit to incentivizing people who yep. see that you're a soft touch. You know, history shows again and again, if you keep on just trying to bribe people, yeah. the people that you're paying bribes to will come back But if more. they're not eligible to be here, then we should be able to deport them. This and, money and, and again, if being... the human rights laws and whatever it is, ECHR, stop you from doing that, mm. then you need to leave them. End of discussion. This money um, should be going towards talk... funding deporting them, not bribing them, exactly. which will incentivize them to come exactly. in the first place. I'm talking of money and, uh, and uh, being paid out, um, £10 million pounds yeah. is the amount of money just last year uh, that Frank Hester, a Tory party donor, gave to the party. Um, yesterday, uh, well, not surprisingly, people have mm. been urging Labour, obviously, but I mean, again, they'll be doing it for party political reasons, um, urging the Tories to pay back that money after mm. comments emerged, which, by the way, he ha everyone keeps saying allegedly, he hasn't denied <laughs> making these comments. He made these comments. He just says they weren't racist. Um, however, it took, I mean, wow. Best part of 12 hours plus, I think actually from The Guardian dropping to the 6 p.m. when the Prime Minister's spokesman put out a statement saying these comments were racist and wrong. I think it was probably uh, more like 20 hours. It, it was Kemi Badenoch, uh, the, the, you know, one of the you know, leading members of government and, and of course uh, Black herself, to actually come out and say what the government's representatives and the government spokesman would mm. not say all of yesterday uh, morning that what these comments were were racist. I mm. mean, when you say that Diane Abbott a black woman makes you want to hate all black women and she should be hot, shot. I don't know what that could be. He didn't say, Diane Abbott makes you want to hate all Labour MPs or Diane Abbott makes you want to hate all people called Diane. Mm. No, he was literally extrapolating from, you know, one woman to all, all women of her colour. Mm. By definition, that, I mean, if, if that isn't racist, I don't know what is. And, and even if it's a joke talking about how she should be shot, <sighs> other comments he's made, uh, also about Indians that, uh, that have emerged talking about how, you know, basically there was not room on this balcony for Indians. Or maybe you could all cling on to that, that train over there. Mm. I mean, you know, because we've seen images from India of overcrowded trains and people holding on to the trains. It seems this man has got a mouth where he just can't stop himself. Yeah. I'm fascinated to know what he says about people like, for instance, the Prime Minister, mm. a man of colour, the, you know, the Home Secretary. I wonder what he says about them when they're not in the room. Yeah. Here's the thing. Should they, look, he's a racist. People who say racist things are racist. Do you understand? It's not complicated. Frank Hester is a racist. Feel free to assume you, mate. You're a racist. What you said is racist. You said numerous racist things. You're a racist. It's a reasonable assumption for a reasonable person to make. I don't think you're going to win in the libel courts. Um, should the Tories give that money back? It's probably already spent. Mm. But should they say, we don't yeah. take money from people who hold these views? Well, this is this is actually a rather difficult question. I know, know a lot of people are sort of trying to present it as an open and shut sort of very clear issue. It's not. If you are a conservative and you are ideologically wedded, I know a lot of Tory MPs are not actually ideologically wedded to conservatism, but if you are and you genuinely believe that your ideology is in the best interests of the country for yep. everybody, including uh, you know, dealing with racial disparities, injustices, all that sort of thing. Actually, you have, I think, a moral obligation to keep that money. Because what? if Yes, seriously. I don't think you should just reward him by giving his money back. I think what you should be saying is, what they should have done is said, we, you know, completely denounce what Mr Hester said. It's disgraceful. But this is that. our record on racism whilst in office. This is what we will do if we are elected. 
and we will put the money towards doing that. I don't think actually this. Uh, I'm well, sorry. no, they're going to no, put no, the money no, towards no, 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 campaigning on yes, Facebook. I, and if they course. believe, and if they believe that they are the best party for ethnic minorities in this country, it is morally upstanding to take a racist's money and put it towards that cause. And I know that okay, lots of, that, I know okay. lots of people so, will so say if, so it's if, not you a know, good book. If if if. I don't know. I mean, people talk about Hitler. Trump. Okay, let's just say Adolf Hitler, right, now was alive and well and said, I'd like to give the Tories money. Do you know that because would they As take, far as I'm aware, he's not taken... Griffin's he's, he's money. not taken... They... Mr Hester has not taken this money from people that he's murdered because he's... No, this no, is no not, saying about... No, no, he's... Got, as far as we're aware, he's got this money through entirely legal means and he's deciding to sort of dispense it how he sees. If you are the Conservative Party and somebody gives you money, if you believe what you're doing is the morally correct thing to do and that person has not given you strings attached, you know, saying, I want Jim Crow laws in, yeah. in, in Lincolnshire, or you don't get the money. If he's just given you the money and you can actually go, yes, and now we're going to take this towards social justice or whatever, you have a moral imperative to do it. And I know I, what you're yeah, going to say, and this is your journalist well. hat on, and you're saying, it's not a good look, it's not with this and the other, fine. But politics is about making difficult decisions. If you can put that 10 million towards here's my thing. a better I, cause... I'm, politics is about making do, difficult who's gonna, decisions. Who's going to do a better I don't think it. it's a difficult decision to say, mm. we don't want to win a campaign based on having 10 million quid from a man who has made outrageously disgusting, numerous racist remarks. I think it's fine to take money from a, like, from a racist person. I'm the person least and put it person towards, going. I think it is fine to take a racist man's money and put it towards anti-racist policy. They're not going to put it towards anti-racist policy. How do you know policy? that? How do you because know Because they've that? already spent it well, on campaigning. What we're talking about is a government that actually wants the, be the betterment of the country. That, by definition, presumably is anti-racist. I mean, I, you know, perfectly happy to be correct I, I on that. I don't think for a moment there are people in government who are racist. Genuinely, this is one of the things. Labour talks a good game on all this stuff, mm. and then they keep it like, again, I couldn't care less who is leader of any party in terms mm. of their sex or their race. It's totally irrelevant. When people go, third female party, I don't care about anything like mm. that. It's totally irrelevant, and it always has been. As, uh, as Margaret Thatcher famously said when, uh, was it uh, her interview, was it mm. Terry Wogan or whoever said, uh, they don't make concessions for you being a woman. She said, no, I don't make concessions for them being men. Mm. But, but this is the thing. It, it, look, when you've got a government of a part, uh, from a party, the Conservative Party, which, mm. which quite... Well, again, almost by accident, because it's totally irrelevant. They don't have a situation where, well, you have to have that job because you're black or you have to have that job because you're a woman. Mm. That is not how things work. Rishi Sunak is not in the job he's in because, because of his, his Asian heritage. No. Uh, Kemi Badnock isn't in the job she's in because of, uh, mm. of her black African heritage. I mean, this, that, it's irrelevant. And that is how it should be. So I think actually the Labour Party is a far more racist party because they're still obsessed with this stuff so, uh, than, than the Conservative Party. So there is a moral obligation if you're a Conservative to then to take that money and stay in office. They're not going to stay in office, but that should be the aim. If you genuinely believe the Labour Party is worth, worse for ethnic minorities than the Tories, the I, Tories have a moral duty to take that money from a man I'd who is you know, espousing racist views this. and use it for the betterment of those people. Please. That's my view. Please get in touch. We want you to get in touch about the failed assignment six of Rwanda, but do also get in touch on this. Give us a call, uh, 03444991000. I'm really, really fascinated to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, right, uh, let's also talk about another thing, story. I mean, amazingly, instead of for once shouting at the TV or shouting at Twitter and being angry, I was actually happy about this. Mm. Uh, the NHS in England is to ban puberty blockers for children from the end of this month. I know you could do it from today if you wanted. Uh, this is something that the government has been talking about a lot, but under 18s will now only be able to take the drugs as part of a clinical trial, um, which is set to start at the end of this year. I wonder how many people are going to be included in that. This won't apply to Wales and Scotland, who are both which can, both insane on this stuff, as insane as England has been until now. Uh, and also there will still be private clinics, is my guess, who will still be able to take these drugs. The, the evidence has been very clear for a very long time, you know, five, six, seven years, when they've actually done studies that these drugs are dangerous, they, they prevent general you know, development of, of the brain, uh, they, mm. they basically set children on a road not to discover themselves, but to go down a road of, mm. of, of transitioning involving cutting off their healthy body parts, um, uh, uh, changing their brains forever, changing their, their, their hormones forever, um, and, and uh, children basically being rendered infertile, unable to ever to have sexual pleasure. <clears throat> I mean, basically, which stuff, the sort of stuff that you know, a 14-year-old can't consent to. Um, I'm, I'm not sure most adults really know what they're getting into, but certainly mm. just children who need to be protected. This evidence has been very clear for a very long time. These are experimental drugs. The WPATH uh, files this body, which is supposedly a scientific body that's been you know, advising lots of doctors and clinics on this issue. They've been really clear in leaked files, um, um, which Michael Schellenberg's got hold of, 
showing quite clearly they know perfectly well how dangerous these drugs mm. are. They mm. know that children can't consent and they know that they have massive, massive long-term harms and they've carried on anyway. This, is it not, is one of the worst criminal acts of abuse against children organised by the state that there has ever been. It's why I don't consider this a victory. It's just, you know, re returning normality to one part of the country, mm. one aspect of the country, is not a victory because yeah. actually, you know, I use the Viking example afterwards. The barbarians are still in Wales, they're still in Scotland, they're still in the private sector. You can still go to them. And let's be clear, in the next couple of months, the odds are the Tories will lose and Labour will come back in. It will get rowed back. Le I'm sorry. Yeah, just Labour, Labour are going to, want is, to carry on with this. They're totally yeah. signed up to this matter. It's been temporarily Clinic pushed back. Still, still hasn't yeah. been closed. It's supposed to be closed by the end of this month. I'm yeah. told, well, the, the, their gender uh, re uh, reaffirming. Temporarily yeah. returning to normality is not a win. And this should never have been allowed in the first no. place. And it has been allowed on the watch of a Conservative government and Conservative ministers have stood at the dispatch box and they've said yeah. all kinds of things. It is not something actually to celebrate. It is a momentary, you know, a temporary uh, moment of respite to breathe out and say, well, thank heavens, maybe a few people won't have to go down that route. But mark my words, yep. Labour come back in, it'll come back. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah, the sad thing. It's terrifying. Absolutely. It, it, it really will. It, it, is, it is an absolute abomination. I've said to lots of people over the last year, five, six years, we've talked about this, you know, I know I sleep at night. I'm on the mm. right side of history on this one. And in, you know, 10 years' time, I mean, hopefully sooner, you know, if you want the people who was basically endorsing, you know, the genital mutilation and the breast mutilation and cutting off of healthy breast tissue uh, in, in, in children, um, and you, you're on that side of it, you're going to have to hang your head in shame. Um, so all, all credit finally to getting to the decision they should have been at all along, um, study after study. It's very slow to it, but, you know, mm. better than nothing. But again, <clears throat> the question is how long it lasts. Let's also talk about the post office. Uh, the government had hoped that was what we were going to be talking about. Great, the government finally does take action. Mm. Uh, we've got this law they said they were going to bring in. I think it's the third time they've talked about it, but it's actually being introduced now uh, to quash all of the convictions of all post office mm. uh, sub postmasters and sub postmistresses uh, convicted because of the Horizon computer scandal. This paves the way for proper payouts being made. We've only had 100 convictions quashed so far. Many, many more are needed. But again, these are slow processes. And we are still looking, you know, the post office is still is still involved in the decisions about uh, about uh, the uh, the prosecutions and indeed about the compensation, which they shouldn't be because yeah. they prove themselves to be dishonest. And a, a handful of people who were rightly convicted will actually have theirs overturned. And this is the point, actually, when you have a burden of justice, which is yeah. that innocent people do not get convicted, and the price for that is sometimes guilty people get yep. off. So be you it. have to then turn around and say, well, you know. This was a major, major mess up, actually. And it is right, therefore, that ultimately all of these people are exonerated because it's just far too many people have had their lives made a living hell as a result of this. So, you know, you just sort of have to sort of shrug your shoulders and go, sometimes this is just what you have to do. It's yeah. the right thing for an overwhelming majority of people involved in this Absolutely. case. Absolutely. Um, and uh, also, you got to remember, the people who, who were rightfully convicted, and there will have been people yeah. who, who, were, who were criminals doing this, defrauding the post office. Um, those people have still got that conviction for, you know, maybe 10, 20 years. Mm. Uh, they still lost their livelihood yeah. at that time. So they're, 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 there's been... It's not a, like they haven't been punished. They're, they're, they've already been punished, indeed. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking to Conservative MP Paul Scully in a few moments. He is a former Postal Affairs Minister. There have been so many over the years. So we'll find out his thoughts on that, among other stories. Let's also talk about assisted dying. Um, Labour has promised to vote at some point in the next parliament, if they get elected, on legalising assisted dying. This emerged in a phone call uh, made by Sakir Starmer mm. to um, Esther Ranson, uh, which was televised on, on IT. TV. Esther Ranson has been campaigning on this. She herself has health issues where uh, she wants to know about this. I've been long, long, long in favour of legalised assisted dying. But even if there is a vote in Parliament, there's mm. always an issue that MPs have repeatedly, when they've been asked about this, been way behind public sentiment on this. Yeah, uh, my major fear when it comes to assisted dying is I simply don't trust the British state on so many things. I don't trust it to get this right. If we don't trust it to get things like, you know, gender you know, uh, yeah. affirmation... They don't even know stuff, what a woman is. If, yeah. if, if we can't trust them to do this, why on earth do we think they'd get this right? And I think everybody assumes it'll be like Switzerland and we'll have dignitas and it'll be very sort of high quality, you know, lots of checks and balances. Nobody ever thinks it's going to be like Canada, where they just start handing out the op offers for people who have got depression or are homeless or are drug addicts and say, have you ever considered assisted dying? And people take up the offers because they are vulnerable. People yeah. with mental health conditions. I, I, I'd want up. a lot of safeguards. There are more safeguards than other countries have got. And I do not trust this 
country's state to get that right. We're not Switzerland. We're not that kind of a place. We are much more like Canada. I think it would be a free for all. I think it would be a disaster. I think a lot of people, vulnerable people, would end up taking their own lives at the behest of the state because they were effectively felt they were kind of nudged into it. And I just will I, not I think you can build. I think you can build risk. safeguards into that. And I think people should have a right to choose the end of their life and do it in a way that uh, is, is dignified uh, for them. Um, but, you know, I, again, I, I think it's, and again, it's going to be a, a free vote for MPs. Um, can I just talk about one thing? And I'm a very big fan of, you know, of, uh, of people having control over their own lives. That's one of the reasons why I ended up campaigning against lockdowns and, uh, and masks and, uh, and and COVID jabs to, to be able to keep uh, mm. keep at work, you know, go to work and things like that. Uh, the COVID inquiry rumbles on in the background. Um, the Telegraph has reported today, and I've got to be honest with you, some of the words that came out of my mouth yesterday when I saw this, I mean, definitely, I'm off air straight away if I say those on air. Um, but basically, uh, they've got some new evidence in, in from the COVID diaries written by Sir Patrick Valance, Chief mm. Medical Officer at the time. Remember him on the telly every night. Uh, the one who got a knighthood for this wonderful job he did. Um, um, he basically wrote in his diary um, that Nicola Sturgeon's decision to force Scotland's secondary school children to wear face masks uh, was totally political and not based on medical evidence. Um, and this was their decision noted in August 2020. Of course, we know that when children were allowed back at school in 2020 in England, they went ahead and they forced masks. Forced, that's the word, forced masks on children in England as well. And we know that that was a political decision. We've seen that in Matt Hancock's diaries and other uh, in, in, uh, stuff that's come out in the COVID inquiry, that that was done, again, because, uh, well, Nicola Sturgeon's done it, and everyone knew she'd done it for political reasons, and then they did it to schools, kids in schools in England, mm. eight hours wearing those masks. Um, it's not possible for me to convey the level of contempt and hatred that I feel for the likes of Sir Patrick Valance, Chris Whitty, Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson, who ultimately made those decisions and okayed them all for these decisions. I know for a fact that decision was not made by the then Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson. He's got many faults. He was not pushing for that. He was arguing against that. I know that for a fact. I've got witnesses to that. Um, these people are so abhorrent and awful. For political reasons, politicians did this stuff because they thought, oh, it's what people wanted. They put kids in masks. And, and, then, and then the people who were supposed to trust, well, the scientific advisors, the chief medical officers, they must think it's OK, otherwise they'd speak out. They knew it was wrong and they didn't speak out. And then they got knighthoods. I don't know how we should even look at these people in the street and it allowed them to carry on in polite society. These people are so evil and terrible. You are a terrible human being for doing this. How any of you involved in these decisions sleep at night? Yes, you, Nicola Sturgeon. Yes, you, Boris Johnson. Uh, yes, you, uh, Chris Whitty. Yes, you, Sir Patrick Vallance. Yes, you, Matt Hancock. How you sleep at night now? How you, show, how you dare to show your bloody faces in public after what you did to our children? Shame on all. All of you, shame on you. I will never forgive you. I will never forget. And one day, one day, I just hope you will admit in public how wrong you were. Benedict, floor to you. I couldn't really add anything to that, so I'll change it slightly, which is to talk very specifically about Nicola Sturgeon, because actually we're talking here about COVID, but let's look at the Scottish National Party's record while she was First Minister, yeah. not just on COVID, which we have just seen, we already knew was about performance. Everything has been done to a poor standards, and I just want to know, when is Scotland going to wake up and recognise yeah. these people are not your friends, not they don't do side. anything in your best interest? I know, is that a which, which of the parties would? I mean, really, <laughs> what, what choices have we got now? Benedict Spence, thank you very much. I'm going to calm down now, <laughs> or will I calm down? Because we're asking about failed asylum seekers who could be paid up to £3,000 of taxpayers' money to encourage them to move Rwanda. I kid you not, that is actually the government policy now. What is your reaction? You can call us on 0344 499 text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Alex says, the only thing they should receive is a bill for causing us inconvenience. Jimmy says, madness. Nailed it. And Stuart says, even stronger reason to vote Reform UK. You had a lot of support for Reform UK this week. Uh, also, uh, coming up after the break, uh, we're going to be talking about that and plenty more with uh, Tory uh, former minister, Paul Scully. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Calm down a little bit after my COVID comments, but genuinely, seriously, not sure I could actually manage any civility towards any of those people. I'm sure a lot of our audience feel the same way. But let's talk about failed asylum seekers getting paid up to £3,000 to encourage them to move to Rwanda voluntarily. It's a new scheme being drawn up by the government. I kid you not. Well, joining me now to discuss this and lots of other big stories is Conservative MP and former Postal Affairs Minister. We'll certainly be asking about that. Paul Scully, good morning to you, Paul. Morning to you, Julia. Thank you very, much. You okay? very sorry to very well indeed. It's very sorry to hear that you are. You've since we last spoke to you, you've decided to stand down uh, as an MP, as a lawful lot of MPs seem to be doing on the Conservative bench. It's not very hopeful of how things are going to go uh, whenever that election is. So sorry to hear that. But um, let's talk about this this latest plan in Rwanda. We've got that bill. It's gone to the House of Lords. It's coming back to the House of Commons. It can play ping pong. Uh, there's a possibility. There is a possibility there could be a flight to Rwanda sometime in April. Believe it when we see it, how many people actually end up on it. But is the solution to the problems of getting people out to Rwanda really actually doing a deal, which apparently the UK struck with the Rwandan government earlier this year, but has kept quiet, for, a, for this controversial deportation scheme that, you know, to be added to by, by actually literally paying people with other people's taxpayers' hard-earned money to move to Rwanda, £3,000. I mean, is that really going to fly with your voters? Well, look, first of all, thanks very much for your kind words. It's always been good to uh, work with you. I hope we can in the future, what, whatever I do. Uh, but look, in terms of this, first of all, we've got to get that Rwanda bill through. It's always going to be a tricky task because people have wanted to strengthen it, in inverted commas. People have wanted to weaken it. The House of Lords is always going to be a big risk of blockage. And so we've still got more to do to be able to get flights off the ground, as you say. In terms of the £3,000, from what I've just seen the, the newspaper reports, I haven't seen detail of it. I can understand the fact that when you have uh, asylum seekers that are, are going to fail their applications, 
often they've destroyed their paperwork so there's and there's no compunction for their country therefore of origin to um to have them back so it's how you get them back and so perhaps if this is the case then um they're looking at uh, how you not we've got to stop people coming in but once you've got people here how you actually stop spending money on supporting them here yep. and better support them somewhere else well i mean i'm thinking very quite unpleasant detention camps here's the choice you can go home we'll put you on we'll pay for the flight fair enough but we even currently right now we will give people three thousand pounds to go back to their home country voluntarily which i still find extraordinary but we're going to pay them to go to rwanda now, i have to say i was mentioning earlier i've always had rwanda on my in my you know holiday list because i want to go and see want to go on the the gorilla trails in the jungle. Could I have three grand, please, towards my, my holiday? I mean, this is genuinely absurd. People were, I mean, I know £3,000 per person over the, you know, 65, 70 million people in this country, tax it payers, you know, OK, it would probably be a few pennies each. But you know what? People have to go out and work for those few pennies they pay in tax. They, they, you know, they don't get given, you know, free journey anywhere. These people have paid money to get here illegally. They've been proven not to have a right to be here. They shouldn't get a single penny. I mean, literally a single penny from taxpayers. Yeah, look, it's a difficult situation. As I say, I haven't seen the detail. All I've seen is the newspaper reports. And, and it's the, got a lot and, of detail and, in it. And in those reports, they're talking about they're exploring it. So I don't know uh, where they are in terms of uh, proposing. No, it as no, it an says they've policy. done a new deal. They've actually done that. They struck right. the new deal earlier this year, and they want. To, yeah. they, they think they're going to be able to remove tens of thousands of migrants who've got no right to stay in the UK but cannot be returned to their home country. What's extraordinary is I bet there'll be a lot of people who will take that three grand to go. You know, go to Rwanda, start the journey again. Who are we kidding? Um, and they're going to take yeah, that money, but and yet and yet and they'll be happy to go there, and yet we'll be told by the human rights lawyers, oh, oh no, you can't possibly send people to Rwanda against their will because it's not a safe country. It's not an easy it's it's not an easy journey to start from Rwanda to come back to the UK. Um, so so you know it's, you're going to take a lot more than three thousand pounds, frankly, as well as a lot of uh, um, toil. To, to get through there. It's not an easy journey. But nonetheless, I think we do need to see the detail. We do, you're right to boil it down to what ordinary taxpayers can expect in their own lives compared to that. That's the comparison that we've got to do. On the other hand, we've got to work out actually, in reality, how do we solve the problem of people that we can't necessarily return, as easy as it sounds, um, to, to return people to I their mean, original countries. Genuinely, countries. I'm at the point where, you know, once we know for sure you, you've got, you have got no right to be here, you don't want to return, fine. Then you know what? Prison camps, oh, I'm sorry, really quite harsh regimes. And I know the Human Rights Brigade will all be up in arms, but at any point, you can leave. At any point, you can I leave, but all, you ain't staying all in I'd all I'd say, Julia, is that we've had uh, Priti Patel and Suella Braverman as our previous two home, home secretaries um, who are pretty firm. They're, they're known to be pretty firm in their um, views on this. If it's if it's that sort of easy, I don't think it's going to be, um, uh, you know, uh, well, we necessarily can't, no, We deliberate. can't do it because of human rights legislation. The key thing is we're going to have to you do, re redo all of that. And you know that Rishi Sunak doesn't have the will on that, does he? Can I ask you about another subject, though? The, the, this, this Tory donor, Frank Hester, yeah. who made blatantly, outrageously, obviously racist remarks. As soon as I saw them, I tweeted out these are disgusting and racist remarks. Full stop, end of. It uh, took a... We had a government round of a minister yesterday. We had a, a government spokesman for hours and hours and hours and insisted these comments were wrong, he should apologise, he has apologised, but, that you know, declining to use the word racist. Kemi Badnock, then, senior member of the government who is black, said, but these are racist comments. Um, but there's, you know, but he's apologised, so we kind of move on. At that point, finally, it was six o'clock last night, we had the Prime Minister's office finally using the racist word about uh, these comments. No doubt also ahead of PMQs happening in an hour and a half's time when he, we know he's going to be asked about it. Uh, should, the, uh, should the Tory party return that £10 million donation that he made last year? Ooh. Given these weren't one-off remarks, there were numerous remarks he's made. We've already got comments about he made about Indians and telling about Indian staff, oh, you can't fit on the balcony, it's over a, a railway line, you could just cling onto the top of that train over there. The man, the man is a walking disaster of casual racism. I can't believe these are the only comments. My guess is he says stuff like this every single day. He probably says it about the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary when they walk out of the room after glad handing him and saying, thank you very much for your 10 million quid. Why wouldn't he? They're, they're black and Asian. Why wouldn't he say it about them too, um, as well as Diane Abbott? Why would the yeah, Tory so party look, want to keep his money? Well, look, first thing, uh, you're absolutely right. It was racist, um, no doubt about it. it. It's been a, a course of frustration for the last few years that constantly we are shooting ourselves in the foot with uh, our unforced 
uh, mistakes by just not getting ahead of these kind of stories by explaining ourselves, apologizing where necessary and just or just uh, calling things out for what they are. And we should have acted a lot quicker in that regard. I, I'm glad you used the word casual racism because I don't know Frank Hester. I may well have been the uh, beneficiary of um, some of his money indirectly through my campaigns, but I don't know him. I, I understand their reported comments on the nuances on, on commenting this as reported. Yeah, No, no, he Guardian. hasn't denied the comments. No, that's true. No, absolutely. So I'm, I'm not going to excuse that. I'm just sort of like, you know, adding context for that. Should we give the money back? Uh, I'm not sure we should, actually. Uh, the only reason I say that, the only reason I say that is that because at the moment, when you have these stories that continue, there's always a race to the bottom. It's always the next thing. It's always the next thing. This is something that was said five years ago, I understand. And why has it come out now? There's always a political imperative why it's come out now. Uh, and it seems to be ahead of the general election. So what's going to happen tomorrow, to the next day, etc.? Labour Party went in a sort of bit of a doom spiral uh, about anti-Semitism and these kind of things. And I think that there always seems to be a bit tit for tat. We should be doing due diligence at the beginning to try and avoid these um, Check that uh, people giving you money aren't racist. You probably don't know. It's very, you know, someone's making these comments. You know, they're not going to volunteer. These are my views. Once you know those views, though, I don't even think it's a question. Like, should the party give the money back? Why would you want to have his money? Well, look, I just, you know, there are there are people with uh, all manner of views, and as I say, this is this, this very distasteful. It was racist. It's that casual racist thing. I think it seems like that sort of boorish pub um, behaviour, uh, if you like. And I don't, you know, I, I don't think they quiz an any MP number of people. If said that, he'd be suspended. Side. You know that, and quite rightly. No, no, absolutely. Um, if yeah, a yeah, member absolutely. of Downing Street staff said that, a press conference, he'd be suspended. Well, I don't know what's different. Yeah. You'd be out of job. Why, you know, if, if his role in the party is he's a donor, why would you want him as a donor? Well, I don't know. Look, I don't know what his role in the party is, and so I don't, don't know. know. You know, Just I think we've obviously got quid. to be careful about about what happens next if he's offering up any other money and stuff like that. I think then there is a question to be asked about whether we should take it. I think if we're just going there, back five years... I don't years even think there's a... Things, think seriously, a with all due respect, Paul, there shouldn't even be a question about whether you take that money or not. There really, really shouldn't be. But the answer is no. The problem is, is what do you do with the money he's already given? Now, I'm going to be on because I just well, want to Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, I want, exactly I'm about, saying. I want to ask you about the post office. You were one of the many former postal affairs uh, ministers. Um, the government has finally uh, pressing ahead with this landmark legislation it's the first time ever to actually basically quash the wrongful convictions of hundreds of sub-postmasters caught up in the Post Office Horizon scandal. Um, they're bringing forward that legislation. They think we can actually, you know, get all the compensation and everything done by the end of the year. Is that soon enough? Um, yeah, because it's really tricky. It's uh, It really is trampling over the independence of the judiciary. But I'm glad to say that the conversations that... Uh, the Post Affairs Minister now, Kevin Hollenrake, and the Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, and the judiciary themselves has um, really sort of, they understand this is a very uh, major um, miscarriage of justice. It's an extraordinary situation. And so now we've got to make that work. And okay. let's get the legislation through quickly. It's be being introduced today. It can be done quickly because I think there's nobody going to object in Parliament, um, even if they do find it um, difficult about the independence of the judiciary, and then we can start the compensation scheme for them. You rightly said earlier how long this is taking for all of the other people in the system. Um, hopefully most of those can get done by August. These people, because we've got to exonerate them first, might take a little bit, well, will take a little bit longer. OK, but, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Conservative MP for now, former Postal Affairs Minister Paul Scully. Still with me is Benedict Spence. I just want to come back to you really briefly on the Tory donor. Around. You were saying there's no reason why they should give that money back. They're going to use it in campaign. They think they'll be better yeah. uh, uh, as, as a government than the than, than Labour Party. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I, I still find it extraordinary that is even a debate within government right now. I think if you believe that your ideology is what's best for the country and best for ethnic minorities, you're morally obligated to keep that money and keep yourself in office. That's ultimately how I think. Okay. It doesn't matter where the money comes from in this We'll instance. no doubt come back to that more in sure. the show. Thank you, Benedict. <laughs> now, failed asylum seekers could be paid up to £3,000 of taxpayers' money to encourage them, not force them, to return to, uh, to... Well, not return, to move to Rwanda. I've been asking for your reaction. Give us a call, 0344 499 Text Eight seven treble two, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. You have been doing that. Andrew says madness. They'll take the money and disappear back into the UK system. I'm assuming you don't get the money until you've actually left the country. I mean, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this government is that incompetent. I was going to say. There you go. Don't here's, just here's don't, a check for three thousand pounds. Don't, don't forget handsome. to get on the plane on Monday morning. <laughs> no, they actually are that useless, aren't they? That, they would do yeah. that. Oh God.
God, it's also that's, depressing. That's exactly isn't it? what would happen what in that exact do. tone of voice. Oh, God. Anyway, <laughs> God, it's, it's painful. Richard says, What is the alternative and how much would that cost? And Jay says, OK, it's cheaper than keeping them here. Yeah, fair enough. Some of those hotels are costing about that a week. Now, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Chris is in Surrey. Chris, save me. Save me. I, I think I'm too late, Julia, unfortunately, <laughs> darling. I would. Um, it's, this is the Westminster bubble at its worst. Isn't it? I mean, they are absolutely ridiculous. They don't realise that uh, there are six billion people on this planet that live on under $5 a day there are three billion that live on under three dollars a day. So three dollars a day is the countries where they're mainly coming from. So you're 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 now putting in, as well as the hotels, food, vouchers, and everything else we're giving the illegal immigrants, we're now making an even bigger pull yep. to come and get nearly three years' salary and go home free. It, it's. It defies belief, doesn't it? I mean, you should say, but they just they just live in a completely different world. Oh, Chris, thank you for talking sense. You've made me feel a lot better. It's not just us, is it? Thank you so much for your call. Uh, coming up after the break, good news. Children will no longer be prescribed puberty-blocking drugs on the NHS in England, thanks to landmark new guidelines. But is it too little too late? I'm Julia Hartley-Brew, you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back.
back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Well, yesterday we got the great news that children will no longer be prescribed puberty blocking drugs on the NHS in England. This is thanks to landmark new guidelines. Joining me right now is Amy Gallagher. She's a former NHS nurse and a commentator at the New Cultural Forum. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I mean, I saw this news and I think, oh, this is amazing. I mean, thank God, finally, people have seen sense after numerous, numerous studies showing how damaging and dangerous and the harms of these drugs and very little benefit from them, actually. But there are still some concerns about whether or not these are going to still be available at private clinics, where desperate parents are going to take their apparently desperate children and also still be available in Wales and Scotland and therefore still be accessible. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Well, I thought it was fantastic news. I mean, apart from the fact that it's taken so long to happen, I mean, whistleblowers at the Tavistock were raising concerns almost 20 years ago now. There were internal reports at, internal reports at the Tavistock that were showing that there was a lack of research, that there was that patients were being told that these drugs were um, reversible, which they weren't. Yeah. Um, which they and, knew. The, which the they knew. knew. Yeah, they knew. And what it took was, and it's such a terrible shame, that it took a person to be actually harmed by these drugs, Kira Bell, who took puberty blockers and went on to have her breast removed to bring a legal case against the Tavistock to actually shun, show some light yeah. on this case. Yeah, well, because she, she, as she said, she was like 14 at the time. She didn't, she could not possibly have been equipped to make decisions about taking drugs which set her down on a route to not only mutilate her body, mm -hmm. healthy body tissue being removed, but also um, affected brain development. Uh, affects her ability. This, I'm amazed because I talk to people, you know, got kids who think that they are trans. There's not, there are no trans kids. There are kids who think that they are trans, uh, who think that they're non-binary. Again, not a thing. Um, we need to. We're, we're, we're the grown-ups in the room. We should be talking. In fact, not a thing. And, and when you say you, you do realise these would render you infertile. Mm, yeah. You do realise that you will never be able to have sexual pleasure. You'll never have an orgasm. And, no one is giving them this information or they just go, oh, I, I, I don't want kids. Well, no 14-year-old wants kids, so that's not an issue. You might at 30. Um, but, th but this is the thing. So little information has been given to parents and to children taking these drugs. But we know what parents were told. If you don't give drugs to these children, they're going to kill themselves. That yeah. is literally what parents were told. Yeah, and they weren't told the effects of, uh, as you say, some of the effects of these drugs, that osteoporosis, that has an effect on bone density, has an effect on mood. Um, There's and, suggestions also some of them could actually uh, um, liver cancer. Yeah, yeah, virus. now coming through with the, the WPATH um, uh, scandal. Yeah, that it can cause cancer. Um, no, you're right, it, this should never have happened. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's terrible that people had to be harmed for, for this to be done. But we are, I think we should, we should celebrate today, to yesterday, this announcement, because you know, we are leading the way in pushing back against these, these drugs. They are still available in America and Canada, and we are leading the way in pushing yeah. back. So. And, and they are exploding. The number mm -hmm. of children being referred to these yeah. clinics has is, is gone up. I mean, exponential is an overused word during COVID. It really is exponential. Yeah. It's gone from a few hundred to many, many thousands. And interestingly, it's gone from being pretty much all boys to now largely girls, because we know the social contagion of girls basically being told, you know, you're born in the wrong mm -hmm. body and, uh, uh, and, 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 and it, it is exploding. And, and what is really, really scary is that, as you mentioned, the WPATH, um, this is the body which is regarded as sort of the leading medical and scientific body on, on you know, transitioning. Whereas actually, of course, it's just, you know, self-selecting people and, and as an ideological campaigning group to all intents and purposes, that they were basically pushing these drugs, even though, and the, 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 the documents that Michael Schellenberger got a hold of show this, they were completely aware of the huge harms, completely aware that children couldn't consent to accept those harms as a trade-off. And, 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 and the basic moral ethics, you know, you know, you're a nurse. I mean, you know, I don't, nurses don't take the same sort of Hippocratic oath as doctors, but you're still in that job to help people. Knowing that you are putting a child's life and future at risk by giving them a drug to appease, appease a sort of, you know, what is often a mental health problem, or simply, let's face it, a child who thinks that they're gay but think there's something wrong with that, and then and then is looking for another answer. I mean, this is. This is, a, this is a scandal of epic proportions. It really is. And it is really a scandal of the effects of ideology and politics yeah. upon healthcare. It's, it is remarkable how much charities like Stonewall and Mermaids and, and just ideology in general had an effect on healthcare, had an effect on clinicians in, in preventing them from speaking up or... or, or turning... They literally lost their jobs yes. if they spoke yeah, up. Yeah, many of them did. I bet we, we know that over 35 psychologists at the Gender Identity Clinic left. That, this and is those, the Tavistock. That was the yeah. Tavistock. Uh, Tavistock. 
And um, many whistleblowers were put through disciplinary procedures. We know the safeguarding lead, Sonia Appleby, went for an employment tribunal because she spoke out. So this has been 20 years of people being absolutely shut down or denied their careers because they spoke out. And yesterday they have been proven yeah. to be right. And they, they were speaking out in defence of children, even just raising questions, saying, but, you know, and we, this is all the debate over, you know, conversion therapy mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, we, it, they, they, if Labour get their way, SNP and others, and some Tories as well, it would basically be a crime for a doctor or a teacher or anyone else to say, well, maybe you're not trans, maybe you're a lesbian, or, you know, maybe you have other mental health problems, maybe you've been abused, maybe it's, uh, it, it's terrifying. Benedict, uh, you know, neither of you got any medical back, you or I have got any medical background, but I can read the studies. I had this over lockdown and, and COVID as well, you know, I can read, you know, the ability to read is quite a basic skill uh, in terms of deciding whether something's a good thing or a bad thing. Mm. Numerous studies around the world, numerous reports showing the harms of these drugs, and yet doctors continued and said, don't, don't question it, because you're a trans if you do. I think uh, we've talked about insanity and we've talked about ideology and both of these things do play a major factor but we should not actually rule out the prevalence for just idiocy actually at many levels of the bureaucracy of this country in politics. I mean you pointed out we've got MPs who will stand at the dispatch box who genuinely don't know what they're talking about yeah. because they haven't read the literature and even if they were they wouldn't understand it and I think it's a lot to do also with the lowering of standards in public life and with that the lowering of the safeguards. There should be intelligent people in positions who can push back who have the authority to say, no, that's mental, you shouldn't but, be doing that. But those people don't exist anymore. I don't know why it is, but it might have to, a lot to do with the fact that a career in public office is not very appealing no, to indeed. a lot of people. But I, but I think, again, in this in terms of dealing with medics, they actually, you know, they sign, a, they, they take an oath, the Hippocratic Oath, to do no, first do no harm. When these drugs first do harm, mm -hmm. and that's the issue, Amy Gallagher, isn't it? That's the issue. These drugs do harm. They know they do harm. They, 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 they know that the children cannot possibly consent to that level of harm. And people, parents are sort of blackmailed. I've got friends and parents who, in this sort of situation, you know, you're told, you know, that your kid might kill themselves, so you agree to it. And if you speak up about it, you're transphobic. You might have your kid taken away from you. And, and yet these drugs are, are not the answer. No, that's right. I mean, the High Court ruling of Kira Bell determined that... Um, um, you know, young people are unlikely to be able to give consent to puberty blockers. And unfortunately, that was then overturned. But what it did lead to was the CAS review. And the CAS review showed that, just as, just as you said, that young people cannot consent to these ideas. A, an affirmative-based approach is, is, is not... Basically say, yes, of course, you're yeah, trans. Yeah, yeah. an affirmative-based approach is not the correct approach, and it's lacking an evidence base. Um, it's just... It, the, all the evidence is there, as you say, but it's just the ideology that, that seems to override the evidence. And that has been the story of this scandal. Yeah, and again, it's the story of all the scandals we've mm. seen on, on, on any medical grounds over, over recent uh, years, which is shouting down and, and, and shouting names at people who raise legitimate questions. We've got a real problem in, in the scientific and medical world. Mm. Emmy Gallagher, pleasure to have your company. Thank you very much indeed, a former NHS nurse and also a commentator at the New Culture Forum. Coming up in the next hour, more from uh, Benedict Spence and the Domestic Abuse Commissioner warns about plans to release prisoners early and Labour has come out against the UAE's bid for the Daily Telegraph. We'll talk to the editor of The Spectator about that. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, you're on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an Eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Worm is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Britt. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. If you've missed the last hour, you have really missed out, guys. Coming up in this hour, uh, failed asylum seekers could be paid up to £3,000 to encourage them to move to Rwanda voluntarily under a new scheme drawn up by the government. And I kid you not, that is actually the policy and it's not April the 1st. I know. Pick yourselves off the floor, please. Uh, victims of domestic abuse will be put at risk by the early release of prison to ease prison overcrowding. That's according to the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, Nicole Jacobs. And Labour have come out against the United Arab Emirates backed takeover of the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator magazine. Shadow Culture Secretary Thangam Debonair has said that foreign governments should not own British national newspapers. And she's quite right. Uh, first, let's get the latest news headlines with Natalia Hulkera. Good morning. Migrants who have been refused asylum in the UK will be offered up to £3,000 each to move to Rwanda under a new voluntary scheme that's being put together by the government. The plan is separate to the one by ministers to send people to the African nation and, according to the Times, has already been agreed with representatives there. The Home Office hasn't yet confirmed the payment scheme but says it is exploring voluntary relocations to Rwanda. Labour MP Jonathan Ashworth told Talk TV he can't believe this is a real plan that's being looked at. I mean, look, what is going on? I mean, uh, like, you've got to have a serious plan to go after these gangs. We're spending a fortune, not only on, or the government's proposing to send, spend a fortune, not on, only on the Rwanda scheme, but this sounds to me like they're admitting that the Rwanda scheme won't work. So they're now they're going to pay the people to go to Rwanda. So, look, I think it's a shambles. Britain's economy expanded in the first month of this year, signalling the UK is on a good path to exit recession. The economy grew by 0.2% in January, according to the Office for National Statistics. The figures will give a boost to Rishi Sunak, who pledged to get the economy growing again. Senior personal finance specialist Myron Jobson told us that the economy may be turning, but there's still a long way to go. We're still in a technical recession. We still have a long way to go. I mean, high interest rates are still weighing on people. You know, the cost of debt is is quite still quite high. And so this kind of prevents people from, again, consuming. Uh, and this is why um, we're still in the recession. Rishi Sunak is facing calls to hand back £10 million given to the Conservative Party after he condemned comments as racist and wrong, which were reportedly made by a major Tory backer who donated the money. 
Frank Hester is alleged to have said Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. He has since apologised for making rude comments about the politician but refused to describe them as racist. A court in Romania has ruled that social media influencer Andrew Tate and his brother can be extradited to the UK after a British police force secured a European arrest warrant for sexual aggression allegations. Bedfordshire police said they are working with authorities in Romania as part of an investigation into the pair after they were detained yesterday. The head of the London Fire Brigade says the service has now completed all the recommendations made by the first stage of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. The brigade has invested in new kit including drones, radios and a turntable ladder which can reach up to 23 storeys high. Andy Rowe says he owed it to the survivors of the Grenfell Tower tragedy to reform the service. It's also about recognising the loss and the pain of the bereaved and the survivors uh, making a promise to them that th this change, the change you, you, you're listening to today, is owed to them uh, and we owe it to them to keep on listening, to keep on learning, to keep on making that change. And around a million adults in the UK are still smoking menthol-flavoured cigarettes despite a nationwide ban. A study by researchers at University College London has revealed that 16% of smokers, that's one in seven, are still accessing them despite them being made illegal in 2020. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, rain is the name of the game for many northern and western parts of England and Wales through this afternoon. Rain will be persisting there with a few heavy downpours early on and there could be some localised flooding issues. Mostly fine and bright for Scotland, except for the far northwest there will be blustery showers and most of Northern Ireland will see some sunshine but cool in the north, whereas across the south there will be bright or sunny spells for the east of Wales, the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England and a mild southwesterly flow will really boost those temperatures above average up to 15 degrees Celsius. Overnight, that rain ban lingers across northern England, clearing from parts of Wales, but more wet weather there by the early hours of the morning. And it heads up towards parts of southern Scotland and Northern Ireland once again. For the rest of Scotland, a clear chilly night with a patchy frost. England and Wales in the south will have a milder night. And then through tomorrow, we'll continue to see that rain ban move its way further northwards towards the central belt of Scotland. The far north of Scotland staying mostly fine and sunny. Rain continuing for Northern Ireland and Northern England and sunshine and showers for England and Wales, some of them heavy and thunder and most frequent out towards the west, so eastern England mainly fine, bright and mild again. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Happy to take our blood pressure down a little bit uh, after the last hour. But I fear we won't because we're going to be talking about all of the same stories and even some more. Still running uh, through all the top stories with me this morning is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to get all my expletives out in the break time about, about the various policies and the things we're discussing today. But hey-ho, managed to do it. Keeps me on air. Um, let's talk first of all about the astonishing front page of the Times today, uh, revealing a new government policy that they've done already, they've done the deal. It's not a proposal, they've done the deal with the Rwanda government. So along with the deal to deport people who don't want to be sent to your failed asylum seekers, illegal migrants in this country, to Rwanda, handful of people. Bill goes back to the House of Commons next mm. week from the House of Lords. Ten amendments, they'll overturn those. And then, who knows, we could actually get a plane taken off the ground with one person on it sometime mm. in uh, April. Believe it when I see it. I don't even think this policy is going to change anything. However, alongside this, they're looking at paying people £3,000, which they already do to return to their home country voluntarily. No, they're going to pay £3,000 to people to go to Rwanda voluntarily. That country that apparently is so awful we shouldn't be deporting people to, people will be paid for three grand to go to. I've been looking at Rwanda as a holiday destination for quite a long time. Amazing gorilla trails in the jungle. You have to trail for a couple of days. These amazing experiences with these gorillas in their own, own habitat. Thank you very much. I'd love three grand of taxpayers' money, please, to go and fund that flight and that holiday. Oh, no, not available to me, because I'm here legally, would you believe? Benedict Spence, you can't make this stuff up. It, yeah. Honestly, if it was April the 1st and they put this on the front page as a joke policy, yeah. you go, yeah, yeah, good, 
Good one. Good yeah. one. They're actually talking about this seriously. Have they got a clue what they're doing? I'm delighted to know that the Chancellor has found so much money down yeah. the back of the sofa, just weeks after the budget in which he gave us almost nothing of value. He's found this money to be able to incentivize people to come and apply for asylum and leave, potentially, to go back to Because you reckon this it's... is not only going to be, a, you know, a free-for-all for people to get paid to go to run, mm. but... But people who are probably going to you know, not be sent back anywhere else. Because a lot you're of gonna, you can think that's going to incentivize them to actually pay to come across the channel. I'll tell you what, it'll, it'll incentivize them to come across the channel. It, it'll incentivize migrants from new parts of the world because actually there will be a way of making money if you come from other parts of East Africa and you are then sent back to Rwanda. And you can then very easily just cross back the border into your own country. There is a way of making money. Now, it might be quite time consuming, but as a, you know, has been pointed out, if your daily wage is about $3 a day or whatever, yeah, it is, cool actually is, yeah. you can make rather a lot of money in a very short space of time. By I doing well, this? it depends, though, because unless you're sitting, you're, you're sitting in a situation, you know, for years and years in, in the UK before you get sent over. But again, if they speed it up, well, I just exactly, think, isn't the me, point that they're going to fast track? There are you. certain things that we do because you know, well, that's the only thing that's going to work. It's not ideal, but that's mm. what we're going to have to do. Um, and, and then there's things you just think, but this is it's just so wrong. It's morally wrong. It's 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 unfair on taxpayers. Some people say, oh, well, it'll be cheap. I mean, texting saying it'll be cheaper than keeping them in hotels. Well, what if we're not keeping them in hotels or on the baby Stockholm? You know, what if they what if we made life really quite unpleasant? Yeah. I know we're a civilized country, but here's the thing: you're not required to go to a prison camp. You can leave the country and go back to where you came from or anywhere else. We don't care. You're not our problem. Mm. Or you can be in this prison camp, and it's not going to be very pleasant at all. Very Your often, choice. Yeah, very often people sort of paint it through the prism of, ah, oh, it'll be cheaper than this option, which is also very bad. Yeah. If you want to deal with the migration issue that we have, which is vast, it will cost a lot of money to do it properly and to fix the problem. The problem with our government and successive governments is they look for the cheapest, shortest-term solution to give themselves some breathing no, space. they look so for a headline. Sell it. Exactly, they so that they can headline. sell it as a win. And no, everybody knows it's not a win. But, you know, it, we, we have this with the, oh, I'm going to, you know, stop the boats. And then Rishi said, well, we're not going to stop the boats. We're just going to get them down to below what they were before. Any attempt to do the easiest thing so that they can portray it as they're making something happen. And that's what this is. Again, it's just not going to fly with most people. It really, really is. Because they're out of touch. They're, they don't understand the country that no, they're supposed exactly. to be governing. Well, I, I, I don't think we're out of touch here, and you can certainly get in touch. I want to hear your views on this. We are asking about failed asylum seekers who could be paid up to three grand of your and my money to encourage them, not force them, to encourage them to move to Rwanda. What is your reaction? Give us a call on 0344 one Love to get your calls. In. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Uh, right, let's talk about some other stories which are equally uh, frustrating. The Tories have been urged to pay their £10 million they were given just last year uh, by their donor, Frank Hester. This mm. after not only actually the comments he made about Diane Abbott, which he basically said, Diane Abbott makes you want to hate all black women. You know, I don't, I don't, you're, you're trying not to be racist, he said. By the way, mm. people are saying alleged reportedly. The Guardian had this story. It's from a, a, a meeting in 2019, a, a company meeting. It's not like a private WhatsApp group or anything. It's an actual company meeting with his staff. He has not denied making these comments. He denies he's racist. Well, it took, you know, pretty long time, about 20 hours before the Prime Minister's uh, spokesman put out a statement after this story emerged to say that, yes, these were racist comments. Kemi Badnock, who is herself black, uh, found it very easy during the day to point out that these were racist. But uh, certainly, uh, big question marks about what happens to that money. Look, in less than an hour, mm. Rishi Sunak is going to be standing at PMQs. Right now, they're in a meeting deciding, does he or does he not say he's handing that money back? And they'll be They'll be focus grouping it and, and checking with other people as opposed to just, in my view, doing the right thing and saying, not only would we never take a penny from this guy again, mm. we don't want his money because we don't take money from racists. I do think that the key thing here is that actually they haven't come to a decision and it should have been a very yes, no, very quickly done. Whatever angle you're going to go with, you're going to do it very quickly so that you nip the story in the bud and it doesn't drag, but they're allowing it to drag. The oh, I mean, this is so is, unusual for this government. Of course, but the <laughs> question here is then, what is it that you think is important? Are you a government that believes that headline's the most important thing or are you a government that believes that your ideology is in the best interest of in the country? If it's the first one and you think headline's the most important thing, you give them 
the money back very quickly and you say, that didn't. was a mistake. Yeah, you say that was a mistake, but we're giving it back because it's just a disgrace. If you actually, and this should be actually the approach, if you believe that the Conservative Party and its vision is the most, is the best thing for the country, you take that man's money and you put it towards getting yourself to be re-elected. Re and then when you're in office, you don't do racist things. That, well, that would be the Which I don't think they solution. do do. No, okay, exactly. I understand that point. And you made that point uh, uh, earlier on the show as well. I, I still struggle with the idea that you can say it's okay. I, I, yes, and I know a lot of people can say, well, it, look, that's just the optics. It's just mm. what it looks like. But at the end of the day, as I tweeted the first, literally 10 minutes after I saw this, these, these racist comments, mm. blatantly racist comments about Diane Abbott, can I point out, there are so many criticisms you can make of Diane Abbott. Everything she says and everything she does, pretty much her hypocrisy. She has made numerous racist comments herself, but she gets away with it because they're about white people and apparently that is allowed. She has said outrageous things, like the problem with Britain is white people, she has said, uh, and talked you know, talked about white people genuinely in a way that if anyone did it about black people or Asian people, they would be out of out of a job. No comments she's made about Jewish people, for reason, the reason why she's suspended as a Labour MP at the current time. Um, I mean, absurdly so long on, but um, it was suspended summer last year uh, because of comments basically saying that uh, Jewish people had never suffered racism, they'd suffered uh, 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 prejudice in the same way, um, likening them to people who were ginger suffering prejudice. I mean, ridiculous, stupid remarks. You can criticise her for a million things. None of them have anything to do with her being a woman or being black. So when he chose to make mm. a comment about that, and he clearly blatantly racist way, that tells you everything about that man. I believe that man, you know, is not, not just someone, it's not just someone who's made racist remarks. I think he's a racist. He's also made remarks about Indians. The, the mm. comments that have emerged today, he's standing on a balcony over, overlooking a train line. They're trying to get the staff into the meeting. Big, obviously, big balcony. Can we get the Indians in? Or there's not enough room for the Indians. They can all crowd onto and hang onto the top of that train over there. Come on. This guy is, he's the, he's the, he's the pub bore, isn't he? He's, he's, he's just a horrible, sad yeah. old, old bloke with, with views that are, belong to the 1950s. Mm. Um, and we, we're rid of that. And if the Tory party, led by the way, by the first ethnic minority um, uh, prime minister, I was British, British Captain Israeli, of course, who was mm. Jewish, um, but certainly British Asian prime minister with, you know, with black foreign uh, home secretary, former foreign secretary, former, mm. you know, uh, Asian, um, uh, uh, home secretaries, people who've been appointed not because of the colour of their skin, but because <clears> they were good at their job and good at politics. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, but you cannot accept money from that man. I think, though, if you were to perhaps ask those people, they might argue that what's more important is a party that gives people like them the means to rise in society is more important than a political party like the Labour Party that likes to play divisive politics with different ethnic minorities, as we've seen recently and with... call recent... everybody who's not white a victim. A absolutely. I think they would say that's a morally better argument to make. And also, I don't think a man who says racist things should get a £10 million refund because he was racist. I don't oh, think Oh, donate that's... the money to charity. Well, I mean, in any way, in any event, I don't think he should be getting his money back. Okay. Uh, you know, that's, I that's think we can all point. agree yeah, that that's Yeah, I think we can all agree start. that, absolutely. Uh, and again, I, I don't like people being cancelled either. If he said sorry, okay, you know, I do agree mm. with Kemi Badenoch on that. But there is also an element for me where, it's, you know, people... When people do these things, all I want is that people, we, we can judge you. We see you, we can judge you. Mm. We can make our judgment and we can decide whether we want to do business with your company or thing. What I don't want is people being hounded out of a job or mm. hounded out of a of public life because, you know, I'm just, I, that's what I think. We get to judge you, but let's have make that honest judgment. Can we move on sure. though? Because there's so much more uh, to talk about. Post offices. We spoke to a former Postal Affairs Minister, uh, Paul Scully, uh, Tory MP, a little bit earlier. Um, government finally bringing in this law to quash, it's, it's, I mean, this is landmark to quash mm. convictions in the courts, but, to, but Parliament to basically basically overrule the courts, even though, of course, the courts have ruled that, that you know, in every case in these ones, these should be overturned. Yeah. There will be there will be some guilty people who get their convictions overturned. I'm remarkably relaxed about that. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, 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 you know, we all know this wouldn't have been happening if it hadn't been for an ITV drama on at Christmas because this has been rumbling on for so long. Yeah, I mean, that's, but that's a sort of a common theme in the UK, actually, about lots of scandals. I mean, you could mention things like Hillsborough, for example, the scandals that just go on for Blood too long. Blood scandal. Because, because the attitude is not, we need to get to the truth, it is cover your own backs in case the truth is yeah. very unpalatable, which are, many people suspect it is. But I do, you know, also I have to echo what you're saying there. Actually, our justice system is based on the idea of innocence until proven guilty. That means sometimes some guilty 
people will get away with their crimes. But the important thing is that innocent people do not are and not punished so for things they didn't do. That's why this is very thousands important. of people's lives were really completely ruined. There's Absolutely. been four people committed suicide. We know a hundred or so have died without having their names cleared. And, and mm. again, um, you can't access the compensation. The key thing for me is also that the compensation is not paid by the taxpayer. Even the post office, we're the sole, sole shareholder of the public. So mm. it needs to be paid for by Horizon. Mm. And also, we need people to go to jail. There were quite clear, quite blatant attempts to pervert the course of justice. That is a serious criminal act. People need to go to jail. I think certainly, as well as having their convictions quashed, people need to see that there is a push in the other direction yeah. for uh, people to be forced mm. to take responsibility yeah. for their actions. Because it's yeah. not enough to just say, oh, sorry, we sorry. made a mistake, yeah, they and didn't you're make, off the Because the we know they didn't make a mistake. They, yes. knew, they knew it. Uh, but yeah, it, it is just extraordinary, isn't it? Let's also talk about um, uh, the revelation yesterday that Labour uh, uh, are going to promise a vote on legalising assisted dying. This was done in a phone call uh, by Keir Starmer to Esther Ranson. She's suffering from terminal cancer. I mean, one of our sort of, you know, nation's sweethearts. I mean, mm. you grew up watching That's Live and programs like that. Absolutely lovely woman. I've interviewed her many times. But um, she wants to have, you know, legalised sisters dying in this country. People not having to go. She's, you know, she's bought a, you know, bought a membership of Dignitas. You can go to a clinic in Switzerland mm. and do it. But people are saying that we want to be able to do this in our own country, in our own homes, with our families around us. And we also don't want our families to face uh, the, you know, the trauma of, of us, you know, dying much later than we wanted to <clears> without, you know, without all our cognitive you know, faculties in place. I, I so strongly support this, but I'm not entirely sure that MPs will vote for it. I don't trust the British state in its current uh, iteration to get this right. And that's what it boils down to. I understand the moral arguments about suffering that people go through and, you know, criminalizing people who help their ill relatives. I understand yeah. it. It's a very emotive issue. But actually, you know, everybody sort of looks at the best case scenario. They look at Switzerland and they think, well, we could have that. Does anybody really think that? That is what we would get in a country where we have or have had for a very long time children being prescribed experimental drugs because well, who knows what their gender might be, where we have, you know, the all-time low confidence in the yeah, police we, we, we and our institutions. Yeah, we put this in the medics, hands of the medics and the lawyers, and actually those people have proven themselves not to be trustworthy. Yeah, I'd group. say look at Canada, look at what, what has is, happened there. What is the I solution? do not trust them. Look, look, and there's certainly there are cases where people, you know, people mm. have been pressured into it, and I've certainly seen some cases, I think even in, was it Denmark or the Netherlands? Where the Netherlands, a, yeah. Netherlands, where a very young woman, I think she was only 18 or something, a woman who's who, who's had depression and wanted to end her life. I'm sorry, no, no, that's, mm. that would not be, I, if, under any law that I would agree with, that would not be allowed to happen. People who know they've got a terminal illness, people who know that they're going to spend the rest of their life, de you know, deteriorating, deteriorating mm. with a, a disease which leaves them with no, no freedom of physical movement, even their mental capacity being lost. Yeah. I'm sorry, I would want the right to end my life uh, my husband and I uh, have talked about this. You know, my mum is, you know, she's a doctor. She said, well, you know, you, you know you'll, you'll put a pillow over my head, won't you? I go, well, no, I don't want to go to jail for the rest of my life. But then family members are left in this difficult... Hi, mum. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, belated. But, yeah. um, no, but people, people are left mm. in these awful situations. I've spoken to the family members of so many people who've been in this situation where they, they just wanted to have control over their own death. I think that that is, should be a fundamental human right. I understand the arguments around it, but much as the same with the criminal justice system in this country, actually one person who is, you know, let's be clear, put to death, if that's what the phrase that you want to do, because they were not actually in a position to be able to make that decision themselves or missold it, that is one person too many. And until you can persuade me otherwise, I would not support such okay. a move. I'd like to think we could have the safeguards, but I understand your concerns on that. Uh, right, more from Benedict Spence coming up. Uh, today, though, we are asking about failed asylum seekers who could be paid up to £3,000 of taxpayers' money to encourage them to move to Rwanda voluntarily. What is your reaction? Give us a call on 0344 499 Don't say naughty words. I'll get in trouble. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. You've been getting in touch. <laughs> Not a surprise. John says, no payment, just deport. Vaughan says, if they have failed asylum, surely they should be deported to their homeland. Yeah, but you can't deport them to some homelands like Afghanistan. And Phil says, utterly ridiculous. They should simply be removed. We owe them nothing. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Please keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Chris in Hereford. Hello, Chris. Hello, everyone. Right? Hello, very well indeed. What do you want to say? Well, I was absolutely mortified when, when they announced this, to be honest. Uh, uh, I just don't think this Rwanda scheme is an absolute joke. Oh, to be Chris, honest. my darling, oh, I, this is such a bad phone line. I can barely hear you. Can you get closer to the microphone or anything to improve the line? Can you hear me now? That's better. Yes, you were on speaker, yeah. weren't you? Okay. Start yeah, again. Was, yeah. yeah, but this Rwanda plan, it's, it's just the joke, to be honest. It's just a disaster from day one, sort of thing, and paying failed migrants to £3,000 to. To go to Rwanda is an absolute joke, to be honest. 
I mean, it is a joke, and, and yeah, I genuinely, as I said earlier, I thought it was April the 1st, and you think, oh, yeah, good one, the time is well played. That's quite funny. But now, now nothing would shock us. I don't think you could make that joke. Nothing would shock us. But what is the solution? If someone says, well, I'm not giving you my documentation, you don't know where I'm from, I'm sure you could trick people into accidentally speaking mm. the language where they're from, I don't know, um, or they're from somewhere like Afghanistan where we can't, we haven't got to deal with them, we can't deport people to that country, the lawyers won't let them. If that's the only way that we can get them off our... Off, you know, out of our country, you know, and out of our, you know, hotels in the baby Stockholm. Would it be worth it? Well, it's just, I, I just think it's, 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 it's the taxpayers' money. It's the harder and people. It's just the paying three thousand pounds for people to, to, to migrants, but to, to put going to Rwanda. It's our money. It's our taxpayers' money, sort yeah. of thing. And I said to the, I said before, I said, it's basically. I was going to vote Conservative in the next general election. Well, after that, they can forget that because I'm not going to vote at all now. Oh, no, you must vote. Even if you go, even if you go and spoil your ballot paper and just say none of the above. If, you know, millions of people did, people did that, that is quite a statement. Honestly, we, there, are people, there are people who are desperate for the right to vote. Please, please, please always use your vote. Um, Chris, thank you so much. I can, I can understand your despair about this though, I really can. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk though about victims of domestic abuse who'll be put at risk by the early release of prisoners to ease prison overcrowding. We've only got 230 odd places in male prisons left, so they're going to release people up to two months early. Yes, really, that seems like the government doesn't have a plan. We'll be talking about all of that up next. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're it to was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, victims of domestic abuse will be put at risk by the early release of prisoners to ease prison overcrowding. That's according to the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, Nicole Jacobs. She spoke out, understandably, I think we can say, after we discovered that Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary, uh, was going to see the release, a release of hundreds of burglars, shoplifters, and violent criminals up to 60 days, so two months early, to tackle the crisis in our jails. What is the crisis? Uh, well, there are fewer than 240 spaces left in men's jails in England and Wales. Just 238 spaces left out of operational capacity of 85,000. Our prisons are 99.7% full. Women's prisons also 99.9% .9 full, with just 118 spaces left. This has meant, therefore, the biggest early release scheme from prisons in nearly 20 years. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Vanessa Frake. She's a former prison governor and author of The Governor, My Life Inside Britain's Most Notorious Prisons. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, Julia. Thank Thanks you. for having me on. Thank you for joining us. Well, you see, you've been a prison governor at women's prisons and also a very famous men's prison, you know, Wormwood Scrubs as well. Um, first of all, I mean, in terms of the risk to the public generally, we'll talk about domestic abuse violence uh, 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 victims as well, but uh, in terms of the risk to the public early, these people were going to be released in a couple of months anyway. Is there an extra yeah. risk to the public of these people being allowed out 60 days early, other than the fact that they've got 60 more days to reoffend? I don't actually think so. You know, when prisoners come to the end of their sentence, many of them are on temporary release anyways and go out daily. Some have jobs and work outside prisons. So I don't think that the the 60 day mark is is anything to be completely concerned about. I think um, I think more worrying is the state of our prisons. And if we have, you know, um, something like the Strange Ways riot where, you know, they practically burnt down the prison we've got nowhere to put the prisoners um i think that's that's a more concerning thing for for members of the public so yeah i mean again a lot of people just don't realize a lot of people who, who are technically still behind bars don't spend a lot of that time uh, behind bars as you say out on, uh, on those sort of schemes um i was quite surprised to see you know in terms of the people who'd be released we were told early on oh no it wouldn't be people who've been convicted of serious violent crimes anyone who's been sentenced to more than four years or or where the you know the minimum sentence would be four years wouldn't be out but Let's face it, I mean, there are numerous violent crimes that people don't get those sorts of, uh, of sentences. And goodness me, I've covered as a news reporter over the years many an occasion when a man has been convicted of the most heinous crimes against a, 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 their partner, their girlfriend, their wife or their ex, um, not been sentenced to four years behind bars. So those people would, would, be, would be on early release. What did you make of what uh, this, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, this domestic violence uh, as czar effectively had to say about the risk to those women that, you know, they thought they had another 60 days of sanctuary and safety from their partner, their ex-partner, but they're going to be back out on the streets? Yeah, I, I totally understand that. You know, any anyone who's ever been a victim of domestic violence is is always looking over their shoulder, and uh, you know, my heart goes out to them. Um, I don't. I do believe that these prisoners on this release scheme will be closely monitored. So we're led to believe, and also um, Alex Chalk did say that it would be low level crime. I don't think that domestic violence, serious domestic violence, although all all domestic violence is serious. Um, is it falls into that category. So I would be we, hopeful that it will hope. be the likes of but, uh, shoplifters yeah. and, you know, traffic offences, that sort of thing. Yeah, but 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 again, they, 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 this problem is not getting any better and is not going to get any better in terms of overcrowding. And let's talk about your experience yeah. behind bars because I think most of us who think that yeah, if you commit serious crimes or you're a, if it's sex sh shoplifting, low level offence be called, not doesn't feel low level for the fortieth time it happens to a shopkeeper trying to make a living. Repeat offenders at low level. Yeah, I'm sorry, most of us think those people should be going behind bars. The big issue is what happens to people when they're behind bars. And the overcrowding issue in our prisons has meant that people are not getting any rehabilitation. They're not getting trained up. They're not getting skills. They're not getting, you know, taught how to read and write. A huge number of people are going to prison, un unable to have those basic skills. Of course, they can't get a job because they're unable to do these basic skills. And also, you know, rehabilitating people, for instance, who are, in, who are, who are on drugs. Pretty much none of that is happening on the scale it needs to happen at in prisons now, is it? Because of that overcrowding. Talk us through what that means for daily life in prison. 
not just for the prisoners, okay. but the prison officers as well. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult um, to manage a prison that is um, running at a at a overcrowding rate of say 50, 60 percent. You know, prisoners get very frustrated um, and and at close quarters. So you have a cell that's been designed for one person suddenly has three three people in it. You know, you can imagine there's a there's an issue of decency and privacy and and that sort of thing. You know, many people may say, well, you know, if you can't do the the time, don't do the crime. But um, but I think we have to we have to think about these things because in 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 sort of the day to day management of it, it, it can be a tinderbox. You know, with with staff shortages, high turnovers of staff, inexperienced staff, prisoners become very volatile, very violent. You know, we we've seen the the violence in prison rates rise um, year on year, violence against prisoner on prisoner and prisoner on staff. Um, so this is all all things that unfortunately yeah. happen when you get overcrowding in this country. We're very keen on locking people up. You know, it's a vote winner. We want to be the party of law and order, regardless of what political party you are. Um, and I think that we need to look more at focusing on reducing reoffending. Every prisoner place in this country costs around 47, 48,000 pounds per prisoner per year. You know, I, I, I know where I'd much prefer my taxes to go to would yeah. be um, helping reduce that reoffending. And, and the way uh, we, to do the way to do that is is often you know and again I I, I look I'm I'm very very clear cut you, you 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 do commit the crime you should be prepared to do the time but I also know that it a lot of people come who come into the prison system they come from they've been in care they've been filled by their parents filled by their schools uh, they you know very easy not to get involved with drug gangs if you don't live on the sort of estate that is run by the drug gangs it's a lot it's a lot easier for an awful lot of us to make the right choices and it's a lot harder for a lot of other people to make the right choice it doesn't I mean they don't have to make the right choices but offering that help offering that rehabilitation trying to get people off drugs educating them giving them a skill so they could actually get a job uh, later on um you know talking therapy things like that some of the some of the western countries are doing a lot of that and they are seeing really low rates of reoffending. we are doing less and less of it and our reoffending rates are pretty much sky high i mean by the time you go to prison basically you're already a, a you know a lifetime offender aren't you for most most criminals so we're just creating a problem that we just take people in we make them worse we put them back out again but how, i mean how many more prison places would we need to build how many more prisons would we need to build to actually deal with this issue because crime's not going away anywhere we're sending people to prison for longer which i think is a good thing personally for some of those crimes but but we haven't got any spaces left it's untenable like what are we going to do what in 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 a few months time we're going to have no prison spaces left we're just going to let a load of other people out yeah, and uh, you know, in two thousand and seven, Jack Straw did exactly the same thing, and that lasted for three years on the early yeah. release scheme. So and this is nothing new, and this is this is what this country does: is we focus on locking people up. We don't re focus on rehabilitation, and that is part of what prison is about. Yes, it's the removal of liberty. Yes, it's retribution. Yes, it's punishment. But it's also supposed to be about reducing reoffending and are getting prisoners to address their offending so that when they go out they become a purposeful member yeah. of society and unfortunately we don't do that at the moment it's not a vote winner for a member of parliament to stand up and say i am going to put money into and invest in reducing reoffending in this country yeah, it's, it's absolute madness. It really, really is. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Hope you come on the show again. Vanessa Frake, she's a former prison governor. She knows what she's talking about. She's the author of The Governor, My Life Inside Britain's Most Notorious Prisons. Um, still with me is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. I think, I mean, lovely lady, but I wouldn't mess with her, would you? <laughs> Can't imagine the prisoners would mess with her. But here's the thing. You don't have to be sort of airy-fairy, mm. you know, liberal, you know, tofu-munching idiot to think that cutting reoffending rates would be a good idea. I'm a big fan of... People going to prison if they've done a crime that they need to go to prison for. But what we do with them behind bars is what matters. We have massive overcrowding, but the government has not put the money in to build more prisons. At the same time, as sentencing people 
to longer spells in prison. It's yeah, ridiculous. Well, that's a lot of it, isn't it? It's also about circumstances you come from, in which case you have to say, well, then it needs to be earlier. It needs to be education. It not not yeah. actually in the prisons. Actually, you need to be getting in there much earlier if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Is, well, don't let parents fail their but the kids. Other thing, Dads need to be in the homes. Don't let kids but, truant from but, school. But the other thing, stuff. if you live in a society that has mass migration and the population expands at the rate that ours is, necessarily you're going to need more prison spaces because you will have people who come as part of that. You will have more people in the population. That will cause it's more huge. crime. Huge amount of uh, people who are in our prison system are actually people who come from. And if you don't, if you don't want to deport them, as our government doesn't yeah. seem to really want to deport anybody, then you're going to have to find somewhere for them. That means more building more prison spaces. Absolute. Yeah, I, I get. I, you can you can put my taxes out to build more prison spaces anytime you want. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, who would be a prison officer now in terms no, of what they're yeah. dealing with? There's the violence from people on skunk and things like that. Uh, right, let's go back to well, people who probably should be in prison uh, failed asylum seekers who won't leave the country. I mean, that would be a simple solution. No, no, government doesn't want to do that. No, uh, they going to pay them up to £3,000 of taxpayers' money to encourage them to move voluntarily to Rwanda. I kid you not. What's your reaction? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Alfie has done just that and says, theft from the taxpayer. Ian says, anything to save £7 million a day housing the illegals. And Key says, could I have £3,000 and a free flight to Rwanda, please? That's what I said. Uh, this is ridiculous. You couldn't make it up. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. So let's go to Cynthia, who is in Swindon. Hello, Cynthia. Hello. Hello. What do well, you make I, of this? I, I look at it this way. First of all, we have the wonderful RNLI taxi service, taxi in the mover. Yep. So to get their three grand, what I would do is I would take their photographs, I'd take their fingerprints, I'd ferry them, I'd pop them straight on the aeroplane, I wouldn't give them a choice, I wouldn't let them go through all the hoops and the loops of going through the legal system or anything like that. I'd pop them on the plane, I'd have a bag of cash, I'd give them three grand each and off they would go. And if they came back, I'd just keep doing it. Because by the Wait, wait a second, doesn't that, as Benedict said, doesn't that just incentivise? So they pay three grand to, the, uh, to the, 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 the people smugglers and if they manage to get across, and let's face it, the ones we count are the only ones we know about. There's loads that get across that we don't know about. Um, and, when we, and, and, and basically, if it goes wrong, you get paid three grand and you can just do it all again. Well, the thing is, it's like this. Something's got to be done. Nothing's really being done. No. And at the end of the day, we're in a situation where... don't we? Cynthia, thank you very much there. Cynthia in Sweden. Apologies for the quality of that line there. Coming up after the break, the Labour Party has come out against the United Arab Emirates backed takeover of the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator magazine. We'll be talking to the editor of the Spectator, Fraser Nelson, up next about why foreign governments shouldn't be owning British newspapers and magazines. I'm Julia Harley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley and you are with Talk TV. Now, Labour have come out against the United Arab Emirates backed takeover of uh, the Daily Telegraph newspaper and the Spectator magazine. Shadow Culture Secretary Fangham Debonair has said that foreign governments should not own British national newspapers. I kind of thought that was something we all agreed on. We're still awaiting the government actually stopping that sale going ahead. Joining me right now to discuss all of this is Fraser Nelson, who's editor of The Spectator. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, explain for our, uh, our audience, who perhaps may not have heard so much about this, about uh, this sale going ahead. Your, your current uh, owners have uh, been forced to sale. Uh, the United Arab Emirates have, have put in a bid. Tell us why you are concerned about this. Because this is the first time that a, an autocratic government, in fact, any foreign government, has tried to own a British publication. It's never happened before. And we don't have laws to stop it happening because nobody would really think of trying to buy another country's newspaper. Now, Britain's got a free market system. We're pretty liberal. We tend not to have rules restricting what foreigners can buy. The issue here isn't foreigners. We don't mind. Um, the British press has a long tradition of, of foreign ownership quite successful. The Financial Times, for example, is owned by Nikkei of Japan. But the Financial Times also turned down a bid from the United Arab Emirates. And that's for an important reason that the Emiratis are a government. Governments shouldn't own newspapers. The principle of a free press means freedom from government. There is no other definition of free press. Not just freedom from your own government, freedom from anybody's government. So if you're going to defend a free press, you stop its um, press being owned in whole or in part by governments. Um, what do you make of... Uh, I mean, I was fascinated to listen to an interview that you did on the Radio 4 Today programme this week, uh, where you were questioned by a presenter about... Yeah, but, but, you know, Individuals who own newspapers, you know, uh, the, the, the rich men who used to own the Telegraph, you know, Rupert Murdoch owning the Times, the Sunday Times, the Sun, others, you know, don't they have influence? Doesn't, don't individuals who are very rich, don't they have a say as well? What's the difference? I know, it's a sort of funny question there. It assumes that if, if a government doesn't own something, then it falls to people to own something. There isn't a sort of third force out there. <laughs> um, but there's a sort of common misperception about the role of proprietors in newspapers. I mean, take Rupert Murdoch. I don't know how many papers he owns, but a good number. Now, there's no way you can pick up, you know, the Australian, the New York Post, the Times, the Sun, and think all of these papers somehow reflect what Rupert Murdoch thinks. He is a publisher. His skill is in selling newspapers. Newspapers only sell if the relationship is with the readers. Now, take The Spectator, for example. We were owned by the Barclay brothers. They were um, billionaires. But not once in my 14 years as editor did they ever tell me what they think or suggest what I should write. Uh, we are 100% financed by the readers. That is to say, the money we get from selling magazines and subscriptions covers all of the costs of the journalism. 
Now, that is the relationship when it's not only, so if you've got, if you are, if you do cover your costs, that, that means that your relationship is with your readers. Now, obviously, this business needs to be arranged by somebody, but the idea that proprietors sit there telling people what to write, that's just a joke. Papers would not sell, the readers would not buy them, they would not be, nobody's forced to buy a newspaper, nor would they if the newspapers don't um, basically are of use to them. So that's why the idea of the all-powerful proprietor as a dictator of policy is a myth and always has and been. And certainly, I've worked for a number of different newspapers and media organisations, and it's certainly, that's certainly been my experience. Um, now, there's not only this, this bid from um, the UAE, Redbird IMI, and it's a fund 75% financed by United Arab Emirates. Um, Emirates. And people, some people have said, oh, well, you know, but it's, it's, it's a private firm, it's not the government, even though the man in charge mm. of it is actually, you know, the Deputy Prime Minister of, of, of the United Arab Emirates. So that, that's a nonsense, really. But there is also another bid um, which would effectively give them a minority stake, but would involve Rupert Murdoch, uh, the Daily Mail, and others as well. Um, are you also concerned about that? Does it make a difference whether the United Arab Emirates are, have 1%, 49%, 51%, or 100%? I'm not sure that it does. Um, my concern here is that government, is governments should not own newspapers. They shouldn't own them outright. They shouldn't own stakes in them. So my concern all along was about being part owned by the Emirati government. If you look at the original Redbird deal, the Emirati government was supplying, I think, something like three quarters of the, of the funding. Now, they would say, no, it's not the government. It's the deputy prime minister acting in a personal capacity. But as you say, I'm not sure that passes the smell test. But right now, th there is talk that the Emiratis are, are thinking, OK, let's see what we, how we can move this under the regulatory radar. Can we make it 49%? 25%. I'm not sure that will um, assuage the political concerns that we're hearing today. I mean, the government a few weeks ago was having concerns about the Emirates owning 15% of Vodafone. Yeah. Now, if they're concerned about that on national security grounds, and Vodafone effectively is a telecoms infrastructure company, then a similar shareholding national press ought to can raise these national security yeah. concerns. Yeah. Now, this I mean, afternoon, word is we're going to hear the government telling us what they're going to do. Now, it could well be that they're going to put this off the menu completely and say governments should not be owning in whole or in part national newspapers. If so, this issue can finally be put to bed. Well, we've certainly heard that's Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser. We're expecting a statement from her. Um, I suppose one of my big questions on this is, why does the United Arab Emirates want to own a national newspaper and a national magazine uh, in this country. What is the purpose of that? Okay, they could they could make money. A lot of people have taken over newspapers and magazines and not make money. I know made money. I know spectators certainly do very well. But what what do they want to own it for? Do you, what do you specifically? I, mean, you've un I understand your philosophical uh, objections, but do you have any practical fears as well about what would happen if they did own the magazine and the newspaper? Well, the motive is pretty straightforward. I mean, not just the Emirates, but autocratic governments world over have been slowly seeing what they can buy in democracies. We saw this with China trying to buy Huawei. We see this of other Gulf states trying to buy things. The Emirates own, I think, a stake in Heathrow Airport, in um, the Dogger Bank wind farms. So the structure is basically we're trying to buy influence, buy soft power, if you want to call it that, by buying up the critical infrastructure of democracies. So it gets to a stage where we're at right now because they've succeeded. A lot of government members are thinking, well, we can't annoy the Emirates because if we don't let them buy the Telegraph, then they might not give us the money we need for Sizewell C, etc. Yeah. So for a relatively small outlay, this is cheap at Emirati standards, you buy influence in a democracy. This never used to happen before the crash, but only when the crash of 2008 happened, did democracy start to think, hang on, we've got so much debt, we basically need the money. So we're going to turn a blind eye to the Arabs. For, take the Emirates, they're now allies with Putin. They are buying his oil, they gave him a hero's welcome last December. Ordinarily, that would make us think, hang on, are we sure we're going to get into bed with them? How much of our critical infrastructure are we going to give to Putin's allies? But that conversation doesn't tend to take place because there's a lot of people and a lot of government departments now who want to stay on the good side of the Emirati government in order to get the extra investment. So what this does, this strategy of buying critical infrastructure means that you buy influence in democracies and they will turn the blind eye when you start to create alliances with some of the bad boys. And right now, to think that the Emirates are basically allies with Putin at the time of the Ukraine war, and yet still we're regarding them as our, our best friends and we want um, close relations, it's pretty strange because you'd think 
that um, when stakes are so high, when people are dying in Ukraine in their thousands and we're doing our best to help Ukraine, we might be a little bit hesitant about getting into bed with Putin's allies. Yeah. So that is the instinct which so far the, um, the sort of the, the autocratic states, if you want to call them that, are successfully buying off via the... Well, I mean, let's call them autocratic states because that is what they are. We've seen it with China, we see it with Qatar on the World Cup, we see, and we see it with Vladimir Putin and all that Russian money that's been in London over the years. Uh, we, we see this playing out, do we not? Um, one of the reasons I think it's so significant and so important, I mean, The Spectator, you played a, a very important role um, in, in sort of challenging often the narrative, again, of our government on things like... Brexit, on things uh, like uh, net zero, uh, and indeed on lockdowns and policies like that. And I want to just ask you before I let you go uh, about the latest revelations about the COVID inquiry that's ongoing. And uh, we see, you know, more scientists coming out and saying that the, this is a totally biased inquiry. It's all about, shouldn't we have locked down sooner? That's pretty much all they care about. But crucially, the latest revelations about Sir Patrick Vallance, he was the chief scientific officer in this country. We saw him um, uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the press conferences every evening. We were all locked in our homes. Um, and he has it's been revealed, wrote in his diaries in summer of 2020 when it was announced that schools in Scotland uh, were going to go back to, they were going to go back in September, but children would be required to wear masks all day, all day, every day in the classroom, hallway and everywhere. That was a decision by Nicola Sturgeon. And he noted uh, in his diary that that was a political decision not based on medical evidence, that children were at no risk, etc., etc. That then followed that policy. We know from other diaries, other documents uh, in, the, in the Westminster government that Matt Hancock then pushed for children to wear masks uh, in England schools as well. Um, I know you and I both knew this at the time, and we spoke about it, and we, we, we campaigned on it. You know, these decisions to put children on wearing masks all day, every day, were done for no medical reason, but purely scientific reasons. So, purely, apologies, purely, purely political reasons. Um, what do you make of these revelations coming out and the abject lack of outcry from journalists, from medics, from scientists, from teaching unions, from the general public, from the government, from everyone. What do you make of the fact that people just shrug and move on? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, just in the same way that there are only a relatively small number of people questioning lockdown when it happened right now, there's still a relatively small number of people wanting to, interesting to look at the evidence and to say, OK, at the time we didn't know anything, now there's lots of studies. For example, were the studies showing that face masks worked? Did they ever emerge? Why did the government change its advice from saying don't wear face masks, that was a scientist's original advice, to making it legally compulsory? Was that done on any scientific evidence? Um, now, Patrick Valance's remarks on Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland suggest that was political. I suspect the decision here was simply as political. You can't be seen to be outdone by Sturgeon. I've been through the Matt Hancock WhatsApp files where he was concerned about being left politically um, behind by, by Nicola Sturgeon. But, but like you, my, my main concern is that if we care about the science, if we care about getting the response right in the next pandemic, in the next panic, we need to be learning the lessons now, asking what did the science show? What did the figures show? Um, now, the lack of curiosity there, I think, is very worrying because the people who need to be asking questions don't seem to be very interested now that the answers are finally available. Absolutely. Well, you did a fantastic job throughout that period. It gave a lot of us uh, a lot of hope. Fraser, I uh, really hope uh, we get the uh, decision from the government today, which I think would be the right one. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator there. Uh, uh, quick thoughts from Benedict Spence. Let's go back to sale of The Spectator and The Telegraph. I think, I mean, we, we were talking about the benefits of the free market and how it's done very well for this country, but actually I think there's a lot of naivety in this country about what the future is going to involve, and that is not, I'm afraid, going to be the free market. If you want to maintain your position as a first world country and not as a client country, of states that are not necessarily friendly. It will involve some protectionism. And this is something that actually the, the yeah. Tory party, the current party of government, doesn't really understand because it still sort of sees itself as the party of Thatcher. No, but I think it's something that Boris Osborne, Johnson... Who, who's leading part of this, yeah. this original bid. I mean, he was he was happy to sell off most of Britain and to the this, Chinese. And this is a major issue, that there is still this idea that everything should necessarily be for sale. But let's forget things like newspapers. Should actually foreign states have any influence over energy production or transport Telecoms infrastructure or, or food? Yeah. I'll tell you what, the Chinese spend a lot of money on is buying up American agricultural land. You tell me, they're doing that for... You know, the good, good of their good own reasons, heart. Come though, on. Exactly. Big question marks there. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up in the next hour, more on the news that failed asylum seekers could be paid up to three thousand pounds to encourage them to move to Rwanda voluntarily, and we'll bring you uh, any highlights if there are any. I think there probably will be today from PMQs. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, yeah, we're going to go back to those failed asylum seekers. You could be paid up to £3,000 of your or my money, encouraging them to move to Rwanda voluntarily. It's under a new scheme being drawn up by the government. Plus, Prime Minister's Questions is about to get underway in Westminster. We'll bring you all the highlights. That's to be a lively one, folks. And children will no longer be prescribed puberty-blocking drugs on the NHS in England by the end of this month, thanks to landmark new guidelines. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Natalia Hochera. Good afternoon. Migrants who have been refused asylum in the UK will be offered up to £3,000 each to move to Rwanda under a new voluntary scheme that's being put together by the government. The plan is separate to the one by ministers to send people to the African nation and, according to the Times, has already been agreed with by the representatives there. The Home Office hasn't yet confirmed this. The payment scheme but says it is exploring voluntary relocations to Rwanda. Talk TV reporter Victoria Innes says the Prime Minister is under the microscope for more than one reason. 
So he's under a lot of pressure to deliver that for voters, especially as we head towards a general election. We don't know when that's going to be, but he has to have something to show for it. And, of course, with everything going on, the race row that we've just talked about, uh, you know, Lee Anderson's defection, this is potentially, you know, a, a push for the government, for the Conservative Party, to put something forward that is that they are doing rather than something that they are not doing. Britain's economy expanded in the first month of the year, signalling the UK is on a good path to exit recession. The economy grew by 0.2% in January, according to the Office for National Statistics. The figures will give a boost to Rishi Sunak, who pledged to get the economy growing again. Senior personal finance specialist Myron Jobson told Talk TV the economy may be turning, but there's still a long way to go. We're still in a technical recession. We still have a long way to go. I mean, high interest rates are still weighing on people. You know, the cost of debt is is quite still quite high. And so this kind of prevents people from, again, consuming. Uh, and this is why um, we're still in the recession. Rishi Sunak is facing calls to hand back £10 million given to the Conservative Party after he condemned comments as racist and wrong, which were reportedly made by a major Tory backer who donated the money. Frank Hester is alleged to have said Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. He has since apologised for making rude comments about the politician but refused to describe them as racist. Vladimir Putin says he's planning on sending troops and systems of destruction to the Russia's border with Finland once the country completes the process of joining NATO. Overnight, Russian state television released a three-hour interview with the president to discuss nuclear war, the US election and NATO's expansion. He said from a military technical point of view, they are on course ready to go to nuclear war, but expressed that using such weapons is not the Kremlin's desire. The head of the London Fire Brigade says the service has now completed all the recommendations made by the first stage of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. The brigade has invested in new kits, including drones, radios and a turntable ladder, which can reach up to 23 storeys high. Andy Rowe says he owed it to the survivors of the Grenfell Tower tragedy to reform the service. It's also about recognising the loss and the pain of the bereaved and the survivors and making a promise to them that this change, the change you, you, you're listening to today, is owed to them uh, and we owe it to them to keep on listening, to keep on learning, to keep on making that change. And around a million adults in the UK are still smoking menthol-flavoured cigarettes despite a nationwide ban. A study by researchers at University College London has revealed that 16% of smokers, that's one in seven, are still accessing them despite them being made illegal in 2020. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's looking like a rather rainy day for some parts of the UK. If we take a look at the earlier satellite and radar picture, you can see the rain started off across many northern and western parts of the UK. It's now mostly cleared for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but it's going to linger for most of this afternoon across parts of northern England and the north and west of uh, Wales as well. Meanwhile, the rest of England and Wales seen some good breaks in the clouds, so bright or sunny spells, and with a mild airflow, temperatures are above average for the time of year, so feeling pleasantly mild in the sunshine. But a cooler day for Scotland and Northern Ireland, although mainly dry and sunny, except for blustery showers in the northwest. Now, overnight, that cold front starts to edge its way further northwards as the low pressure system to the north of the UK moves away. So it heads up towards parts of southern Scotland, much of Northern Ireland, still lingering across much of Northern England, and another batch of wet weather heads to the west of Wales. Elsewhere, a mostly dry night, mild in the south, cool and chilly across uh, the clear spots in Scotland. Through tomorrow, that rain continues its journey further northwards to the central belt of Scotland as well as across southern Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, there will be sunny spells and showers most frequent across western parts of England and Wales. Mild once again, though. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Still with me in the studio is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. We just really can't get rid of him. Uh, <laughs> still here. <laughs> still, both still here. Um, <laughs> always a pleasure. Absolutely great to have That's you That's what I was waiting I, for. I, no, and I actually <laughs> meant it. I, you know, I just don't like to be too nice to him because he'll keep coming back. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking in just a couple of minutes about the insanity of this plan to pay £3,000 to failed asylum seekers uh, to uh, basically leave voluntarily to go to Rwanda, as opposed to being deported on a plane. We'll get to that in just a couple of moments. First up, though, Benedict, um, PM Keys has just started in the House of Commons. We are going to be getting our political uh, commentator, Peter Carwell, in the studio. He's going to be getting some clips of the... We always say, if there are any highlights, mm -hmm. and it, I'm pretty sure there will be highlights, or maybe lowlights for the Prime Minister today. He's in PMQs today. He's got to deal with the issue with, of his... Uh, uh, his do do Tory donor, 10 million quid last year, Frank Hester, who's not just been accused of making... It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not allegations of making racist remarks. He made racist remarks. He's not denied them. He's apologised. Do we move on or does he have to pay the money back or at the very least give that money to charity would be the question. Certainly, uh, Andy Street, who's the West Midlands Tory mayor, has said he should give the money back. Bearing in mind, Diane Abbott, the black female Labour MP, well, former Labour MP, now independent, who may, who, who was the, the subject of his remarks, saying, you know, Diane Abbott makes you want, me want to hate all black women, um, blatantly racist remark. She's in the chamber, also interestingly in the chamber, George Galloway, newly elected from the Rochdale by-election, and of course, Lee Anderson, newly defected to Reform UK. Not a comfortable... PMQs for Rishi Sunak. No, there's a lot going on, and I do hope that they all try to ask questions and that we get to hear what they have to say. Perhaps not George Galloway, actually. That would be a bit tiresome. No one wants to hear what but, they but, have to say, apart from George Galloway. Yes, but not even his constituents. It, it certainly, though, it, In Gaza, it makes well, they for, can't hear him. He's yeah, a long way away. it's a long way. It certainly makes for a very febrile atmosphere, increasingly. I mean, when, when is it not? But, I mean, the, the inability of the party to come down on what side it was going to be on the Frank Hester story, make a decision very quickly, it almost doesn't really matter what it is. Is because you can make arguments in favour of keeping or giving it back, but just make a decision. The inability to do that and then sending out ministers to do the media rounds where they sort of dithered and dallied. Yeah. The, the only one who's actually sort of come out and been very forceful on this has been Kemi Badenoch, who, yeah, that's just how she is. She said, it is X, Y, Z. Well, everyone was saying that's and... terrible, he's apologised, we yeah. should move on. Kemi Badenoch was very, very clear. What he said was racist. It's not up for debate. It's not. I'm sorry, it's really not. When you take a black woman, you, do, mm. you extrapolate, makes you hate all black women. He didn't say all people called Diane. Diane, no. or all former shadow home secretaries for the Labour Party. That we he know was, of. That could still was, come out later. Yeah, <laughs> he's also made comments about Indian people, yeah. about, oh, you know, but again, crass 1950s pub bore style comments. Here's yeah. my thing. I want to say this, Prime Minister. Seriously, why would you want this guy's money? Why do you why do you not want to okay, maybe don't give it back to him, don't benefit him, but give it to charity. You might I don't care if you've spent it, borrow it. You've got enough multi-millionaire donors, get it from someone else. But but he's even made comments, you know, say about Indian people. Well, hold on a minute, you know, well, why don't you cling onto the top of a train if mm. there isn't enough space? I mean, the man is just a blatant racist bore, no question at all about it. What does Rishi Sunak think that this man says about him when he leaves the room? What do you think he says about James Cleverly? What do you think he's said over the years about, you know, Priti Patel or, or Suella Braffman or anybody else? Mm. I mean, does he think, does he think that, oh, it's okay, he said it about a Labour politician? I mean, from that perspective, that might incentivize them to stick two fingers up at him and keep his money. Because, you know, right now the Tories are not polling particularly well, so you couldn't say that it's been 10 million well spent. Why should he get a rebate? I mean, I suppose if you then give him the money, you incentivize people to uh, potentially just be incredibly rude about Tory MPs on the off chance. So they might have back. to get their money back as well. And why should it be that these people are the only people who are going to get refunds when the rest of us are having to rest you know, rest deal, not... deal with the mess? What about the dealing with... I mean, is, I mean, George Galloway, he's not going to be a popular figure in the House of Commons, although, I mean, the Labour will love the idea that he's, you know, causing trouble uh, for, mm. for, the, for the Tory government. Actually, you know, most of the Labour, Labour front bench, they're on side with the government when it comes to issues like Gaza. Gaza yeah. um, uh, and also, of course, they lost they lost having that seat themselves in Rochdale, so mm. they'll be angry about that. Uh, Galloway is not, should we say, clubbable, um, so that <laughs> won't go down well. But Lee Anderson crossing the floor, well, crossed the floor to no other MPs of his own party. He's the only Reform UK party, their first. Mm. Who knows whether he'll be their only, their last. Um, but um, no doubt, you know, him crossing the floor, that is an embarrassment. I know the, P the Prime Minister's already, already addressed 
uh, 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 that uh, saying that Lee Anderson is warming up the op on the, the opposition benches. No, sorry, Keir Starmer said Lee Anderson is warming up the opposition benches mm. for the Conservative Party. I think the problem is everybody expects the Conservatives to lose the next general election. And so what will that be the effect on, on reforms vote? We are yet to see. It, you know, you might have people sort of focusing their minds as they get onto the ballot box and say, actually, I'm not going to vote for reform. I'm going to vote Tory to keep this Labour MP out. I think Galloway is a much more interesting figure because there is this presumption that Labour are basically on the coronation trail. They're going to walk it, which means that people who might vote Labour might actually look at the issue of Gaza and say, do you know what? I'm going to vote with my conscience on yeah. this. I'm not going to give my vote to the Labour. If there is a, a Workers' Party of Britain candidate, people like George Galloway, if they put themselves up in certain constituencies, that might take away enough support, as we saw, uh, with Galloway, it might take away enough support to lose Labour a few more seats. Now, I don't think it's going to stop them winning a majority, but it could be very embarrassing, potentially more embarrassing than lose, the Tories losing seats to reform, yeah. which everybody's expecting them to lose anyway. Yeah, indeed. I mean, just for just say, um, we are going to get a clip of this uh, very, very soon, but Keir Starmer, in his uh, question, first question to Rishi Sunak, uh, he is talking about Frank Hester, uh, about that donor's comment, saying um, the Tory donor had uh, said to MP Diane Abbott should be shot. He said, what racist woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister would agree to hand back the £10 million donation? Um, uh, so, and Rishi Sunak has pointed about uh, Starmer's double standards, so pointing out that his own deputy leader, Angela Rayner, had called Conservative opponents scum. It's uh, obviously going to be a very lively one. We will bring you the best bits in just a few moments' time. Now, first up, let's uh, go back to this absurd, ridiculous, crazy, crazy notion of paying failed asylum seekers up to £3,000 to encourage them to move to Rwanda voluntarily. This is under a new scheme drawn up by the government. They've done a deal with the Rwandan government. They're actually going to... They're going to actually go ahead with this alongside the forced deportation scheme if that ever actually uh, gets off the tarmac. I want to hear your thoughts. Do give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 87222 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Well, joining me now to discuss this is former Border Force Chief Immigration Officer Kevin Saunders. Hello, Kevin. Good morning. Good, Good afternoon, morning. Good afternoon, Julia. late night for Kevin. Um, my first thought when I saw this on the front page of the Times was checking the date. And no, it was still mid-March. It wasn't the 1st of April. They're genuinely doing this. This isn't a proposal. It's not something a backbench MP has said. This is something, a deal the government has already done. And it will extend these £3,000 payments, which are already available to failed asylum seekers, to voluntarily go back to their own home countries. This, there would be to go to a to Rwanda, when it's not their home country. Is this, you know, mad and crazy, but the only way of getting rid of these people? Or, or, or is this just the latest failed attempt to try and do something, anything to do with this issue? OK, right, let's try, try and put this into perspective. Uh, I must admit, when I heard this yesterday, like you, I was a little surprised. <laughs> However... I've managed to drill down, see what is actually going on. And actually, it's not as daft as it first seems. Wow. We have a voluntary assistance um, removal system already in place. And 19,000 people used it last year. So that's 19,000 people we didn't really want in the UK we gave them £3,000 each and waved goodbye. And all we're really doing is extending this to illegal migrants that we're saying to, look, you, you've failed your asylum. We're going to send you to Rwanda. But if you go voluntarily next week, we'll give you 3000 quid. How about it? Now, that actually does make an awful lot of sense um, financially, we reckon that it costs about £50,000 um, as soon as an illegal migrant lands in the UK for the first year. So, and that's on a 2012 figure. So we're, we're, we're saving money if we're only going to give them £3,000. Also, of course, it's going to save massive amount of money in legal aid, yeah, because if the they courts. go, they're not going to be pushing a claim. 
Yeah. Um, that will so save us money. So you're basically saying it's going to be quicker, money. it's going to be cheaper, they're <laughs> definitely going to leave, you know, if, 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 if they pretty sure they're going to end up on one of these planes. So, so we may as well just get it over and done with. But you've got to understand how much this will stick in the craw for so many <laughs> hard-up taxpayers right now. They're working really, really hard to pay, you know, pay their bills, pay, you know, paying their taxes, which, whatever the government says, have gone up. People are really struggling with the cost of living. And, and then people who are here illegally are being given huge sums of money to go away. Yes, I mean, you're, you're, you're right. It, it, it isn't going to... It do, when you put it like that, it doesn't sound very good. But at the end of the day, these people, if they stay, are going to cost us a hell of a lot more than £3,000. shouldn't we have a third so, option, which is that they don't stay and they don't cost us a hell of a lot more? Now, we've got this thing about not having them in hotels, and there was a point, you know, in the last year where people were in four-star hotels. I think they're trying to get, you know, get rid of all those uh, uh, points. But, you know, if... I know this, people think, oh, you're a horrible human being, but, like, if people have the choice of going, of, you know, going to Rwanda and starting a new life there or, or leaving and going back to their own country or, frankly, just sodding off back to France from whence they came, that desperate, horrible country, apparently, we're all supposed to be fleeing from for our lives, um, then, you know, why not just say, well, the alternative is you're going to be having a very, very unpleasant life. You're not going to be allowed to move around as you choose. I know they're not living on a load of money, but they're able to go and work in the black market. We know that's what's going on for many of these people uh, because you're allowed in and out of your hotel or your, or your hostel. Put people into what are effectively prison camps. Yes, we can still be civilised, but at the end of the day, life is not going to be very pleasant for you and you're probably better off leaving. Off your hop. Would that, why do we have to pay people three grand? Because all those options that you've come up with, while, while they're, they're very good ideas, they would cost an arm and a leg. Right. I mean, I'm one of the people that would like to see every single illegal migrant that lands at Dover to be detained. But we can't do that because it would cost an absolute fortune. So we can't do it. So if you like it, getting rid of them to Rwanda for £3,000 a head is, is a, a very good deal. OK, here's the... What do other countries do? I know you, you, you and I have talked before about, for instance, you know, the, the rate of approvals of uh, asylum seekers, and we know, you know, ours is sky high uh, on the face of it compared to uh, and other countries like Germany, like France, and that's probably why a lot of people end up coming here, not just the language uh, uh, and things like that, which often will be people's second language. Um, what are other countries doing about this? How are they dealing with it? Because we know this is as much a crisis in France, in Italy, in Greece, in, 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 in Germany and elsewhere. Well, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, given status in, in the, this, these countries, like, like in the UK, and they have a, a welfare scheme. But the, the, there is a lot more hostility uh, towards uh, uh, people from abroad uh, in these countries, particularly now in Germany, because they were housing a lot of these people in the old eastern half of Germany, and there are there are real problems there the, um, with the locals not wanting them, and we're seeing this in France as well. And if you look at Hungary, for example. I think the number of asylum seekers that Hungary have actually taken, you could count on the fingers of both hands. That's so in Europe, there is a, 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 a swing much far, further to the right than in the UK. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a huge problem. Yeah, although, again, I've never understood why people think it's a right or a left wing thing in terms of who should be allowed to come into our country, who has a right to stay. If you could um, be put, you know, in charge of, you know, not just in your previous job, but actually of the policy, what would you do? What would you actually do? Well, I think there, there are two things that I, I would, if I, if, I could, if I could run the country, I would go to the French and I would say to the French, look, You've got to stop these boats. You've got to get to. your, you've got to get the Gendarmerie Maritime onto the channel and intercept people in French territorial waters and take them back to France. Uh, and, and that's, you've got to do a deal with the French, which will be almost impossible, but you, you've, you've got to find some way of doing that because that will, that will stop them. I would also, Ask the French to remove the charities 
that are working in northern France because they are almost encouraging people there. They're helping them out. They're telling them what to do when they get to the UK. It's not helpful yeah. to us what the charity is doing. Now, I know that sounds awful, Julia. I no, know it doesn't. It does. That we know that but, these are these are political organisations. They've got an agenda. They genuinely again all the people who criticise any policy that's taking place it nearly always the people who, when you ask them, don't seem to think there should be any limit on the number of people. They basically think we should have open borders. I mean, you think, I mean, this is simple, simply nonsense to the vast majority of Britons. Um, Kevin, thank you so much always for joining us. Talking sense, he knows his stuff, which is why we have you on. Uh, Kevin uh, Saunders, there, who uh, is the former Border Force Chief Immigration Officer. Thank you. Um, still. With us is uh, Benedict Spence. Um, I'm quite interested to hear him say, you know, look, you know, this isn't as daft as it at first seems, and it'll end up being cheaper. And the reality is, you're going to spend tens and tens of thousands housing these people over a long period. You're going to spend tens of thousands in legal aid and fight all these issues. Why not just go? Here's three grand. Sod off. They will come back at some point. And this is the thing. We, It'll Britain, still be cheaper. Britain, no, it won't, because Britain is entirely at the mercy of global events, and all it takes is another war somewhere else in the Middle East or North Africa, and then suddenly there's the next great swathe of migration. Uh, and ultimately, what is going to solve this is the, is the stick rather than the carrot. Talking about doing deals with the French, no, they're going to let them come across anyway because it's in their interest too. Yeah. The only solution to this is purpose-built detention centres on British soil, yes, they're expensive, but that has to be the solution, the deterrent approach, rather than saying, here's a little burn of money, go away, and they'll come back in a few more years, because they will. And ultimately then, we're also at the stage when the next great war happens, and there's a massive influx of yeah. people. Do we just keep on you know, forever just handing out money? And also, the Rwandans do not have infinite capacity to take all of these not people. Sure it they doesn't, want all of these people. No, indeed. it doesn't solve the issue. Indeed, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm asking you about this, uh, about failing, a failed asylum seekers. So people who been judged not to be here legally, no right to stay here. Can't get rid of them, though. Uh, they could be paid up to three grand of taxpayers' money to encourage them to move to Rwanda. Previously, they've been paying the government genuinely 19,000 people, as Kevin Saunders confirmed uh, to last year alone, um, to just voluntarily uh, go home. This would be to go to the third country of Rwanda. Your reactions, please call us on 0344 499 1000. Text 87222. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Gavin says, what would stop... This is exactly a point. What would stop them taking the money, then coming back or sending a relative who could vouch for them later? Connie says, no chance this will work. It would just be an incentive for more people to try their luck. And Tom says, no, it is yet another level of acute unfairness and utter ineptitude from the government. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming and keep them clean. Uh, let's go to Anne, who is in North Wales. Hello, Anne. Hello. Hello. What do you want to say? Uh, I was just going to say, this isn't new. In 1972, there was a Member of Parliament who came up with virtually the identical scenario. He said, if we... And this is in 1972. He said, give them £3,000 because what they want is a better life so they could go back to their own country, start a business put into their own community, mm. and instead of using the taxpayers' money, take the money from the international aid from their country. So oh. you're giving back, but instead, instead of the government of the country, you're giving it back to the individuals. Now, everybody's talking about... And okay, so what's that specifically about people who'd arrived here illegally, as opposed to people who've come here as economic migrants completely legally and have every right to be here? Well, that's for the government to decide. But the people who've thrown the phones into the sea and yeah. got rid of the passports, there's a reason for that, isn't there? Yeah. But if oh, they, they went, oh, no, they, they always they keep all their phones. Say, no, they they, they all throw say away the passports. They want a better life, don't they? Yeah. That's what they ask yeah. for. So if they're given that money from the international aid of that country that they're going to, mm. so it isn't costing the taxpayers directly. I mean, we give money it's to the international aid anymore. anyway. Yeah. Um, and they go back and start a business, say in their village or their town, they're putting back in their own community and they get supposedly getting a better life. The, the, the issue with this, of course, A, would they do that? Um, probably unlikely. And B, they'll just come and try and come again. Uh, and B, would you be in a situation where, again, Rwanda is different. They're going to another country. They don't but what speak I'm the saying is, it and... isn't new. In 1972... No. These, these ideas... Well, again, no, but, no, but the, returning, returning to your own country, that idea, that, that's... That, we, we paid 19,000 people to do that last year in total. Um, really interesting call. Thank you so much, Anne. Appreciate 
Canada and in North Wales. Coming up after the break, uh, well, uh, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer have been going head to head at PMQs in Westminster. Judging from what's been uh, said in the exchanges, there'll be a lot of highlights. Uh, we'll be bringing you all of those up next. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, we're missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hollybury. You are with Talk TV. Now, Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer have gone head to head at PMQs in Westminster in the last half an hour. Joining me to discuss this right now is Peter Carwell, Talk TV's chief political commentator. All sister with us is Benedict Spence as well. Um, Benedict, you and I were just discussing, you know, quite a, quite a difficult one for Rishi Sunak. So, Peter, you were watching it, so we don't have to. Um, uh, got not only the conversations about, undoubtedly, would have been brought up about Frank Hester, the yes. donor, but also. Diane Abbott mm -hmm. in the chamber yep. are there sitting as an independent and also uh, the ghosts of, of, of MPs past, George Galloway, the new mm -hmm. MP for Rochdale and Lee Anderson, yeah. the new MP for Reform UK, having walked over from the Tories. So quite a difficult <laughs> scenario yes. to walk in if you're Prime Minister. What has happened? Well, it's said that, yes, Lee Anderson and uh, George Galloway sitting together in the naughty corner, I'm sure it'll be called at some stage. But yes, a very, very difficult Prime Minister's questions for Rishi Sunak. He spent a lot of time studying his notes and not looking up. There was a reference by Keir Starmer to the speech, the extraordinary speech he gave about 10 days ago. Remember that Friday evening where he mentioned extremism and how they were going yeah. to deal with it? And then uh, a reference to Frank Hester as well. 
Also, the sort of Debbie McGee question was asked, where she uh, was famously asked by Mrs. Martin, what first attracted you to the millionaire Paul Daniels? Uh, that was sort of slightly how Keir Starmer got into the donations from Frank Hester. He's got was really topical stuff. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what we're going to look at now. Oh, let's have a watch and a listen. He chose to anoint himself as the great healer and pose as some kind of unifier. But when the man bankrolling his election says the member for Hackney North should be shot, he suddenly finds himself tongue-tied, shrinking in sophistry, hoping he can deflect for long enough that we'll all go away. What does the Prime Minister think it was about the hundreds of millions of pounds of NHS contracts given to Frank Hester by his government that first attracted him to giving £10 million to the Tory party in the first place? Mr Speaker, I'm absolutely not going to take any lectures from somebody, from somebody, from somebody who chose to represent an anti-Semitic terrorist group, Hizbut Tahrir, who chose to serve a leader who let anti-Semitism run rife in this Labour Party. Those are his actions, those are his values, and that's how he should be judged. I have to say, I'm not sure Sunak's uh, response to that was really very good in terms of uh, criticising uh, someone who was a lawyer representing people. Lawyers do that. Uh, yes, but he was happy to... Let's face it, Kirsten was happy to try and get uh, Jeremy Corbyn elected to the uh, the Prime Minister, so he, 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 you know, he needs to be held to account for that. But um, look, it was a rather sort of laboured question yeah. from Keir Starmer, as it often is. I, I take lessons from him. <laughs> uh, we can both ask long questions. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but, can you? Uh, let me go into a longer question. Never noticed that. That was a lovely short Never noticed that. Shush you. It's not, my, it's not my fault. Everyone's got a verbal tick. That's mine. Anyway, but Frank has to look, that's not going away. We've had Kemi Badnock come out first mm -hmm. yesterday, you know, obviously a black senior cabinet minister saying, yeah, it was racist. This after hours and hours mm. of Downing Street and the minister put out on the rounds that Kevin Holliday yeah, not saying it wasn't Kevin Hollinger, yeah, yeah. not saying that, that it was racist, but it was awful, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, he's apologised. Even Kemi Badnock there said, oh, he's apologised. Mm. Then we've had Andrew Street, the West Midlands mayor, and the Tory saying, give the money back. Is it tenable? for the Conservatives to keep that £10 million from this man, given these aren't the only comments he's made. There's also comments about Indian people yeah. clinging to the top of trays. There's yeah. going to be more. This guy is clearly the racist pub bore from the 1950s, and everything he's ever said is along these lines, and he thinks it's all fine if you apologise. Is it tenable? Are we not going to be seeing in the next few days yes. that money being handed back? Yes, it's inevitable, and they should just do it now and get it over with. There's also the... Why don't they get that? Um, what, are they, what, what is going on in number 10 that they, they don't They want get it that? to go away and they have a history in number 10 of simply wishing things away and not acting decisively at the start. But it, so, did it take you a nanosecond to read those quotes and go, oh, is it, isn't it racist? It's clearly racist. It's very, very clearly racist and it's really straightforward. He talked about Diane Abbott. He said he wanted her to be shot and he wanted to hate yeah. all black women everywhere. It's clearly racist. And there was this bizarre dance yesterday between the three separate ministers who were out one first thing in the morning saying, oh, I don't think we should label oh, it racist. Paris one saying it line. might be a bit racist. Then Kemi Badenoch saying, uh, which was not the number 10 line, yes, of course it is. She bounced him into saying this, yes. didn't she? No doubt at all I was going to bounce him into this. Um, now, we I mean, know Diane Abbott, um, she was in the chamber yes. trying to get the speaker's line. Did she get to ask a question in the end? Uh, I don't think she not, did ask a question at one now. stage, but oh. actually we, we did later on go on within Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer's uh, exchange to substantive issues or more uh, financially substantive issues in regard to the budget and Keir, and, uh, uh, Keir yes, Starmer was Yes, BMQ since the budget. That's and right, again, yeah. Apparently there was a budget last week. I know, I know. Well, you, you'd be forgiven for forgetting that, given that it was such a damp squib then and has been since. But really, uh, Keir Starmer was asking and saying this is evocative and the uh, tax cuts and the various commitments made evocative of the Liz Trust time. So we'll have a look at this now. OK, let's have a watch and a listen now. But two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Yes. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 <laughs> all over again. Is it any wonder that he's too scared to call an election yeah. when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party is by voting Labour? Why doesn't he come clean and tell him under his plans Britain people's taxes are going up, Mr Speaker? 
Now, that would work if our taxes weren't also going yes, up. Yes, exactly. There haven't been well. uh, dozens of tax rises, literally dozens, over 24 uh, tax rises under the Conservative Party. So, um, yeah, this was a, a bad day for Rishi Sunak. It was never going to be a good day, and that's slightly politically the beauty of Prime Minister's questions, that yep. the Prime Minister has to appear. Now, I, I paid a expense, though. You know, we, we've just mm. seen those clips, and look, clearly Rishi Sunak is on the back foot. He seems to be on the back foot on an awful mm. lot of things. We've got, you know, a, 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 a former deputy chairman of the party uh, who, who, is, who has crossed over to another party. Uh, we've got, um, you know, allegations of clearly blatantly racist donors not having the money back. A budget that was a complete damn squib that people have just shrugged at and hasn't changed the polls. Talk, I mean, there was frantic talk last night in Westminster about uh, the head of the, uh, the chair of the, the select the 2022 committee basically going to see mm. Rishi Sunak and there was a private meeting meeting what was he told at this meeting what frantic thought at the, for a few hours wasn't there that there might have been uh, enough no let, no confidence letters going yeah. in this is a, this is a prime minister who cannot get a grip on the narrative i'm sure peter will be able to expand on that about the 22 committee uh, in a few seconds but i think it's it, going back to what you said about this being a government that just wishes that bad things would go away and it just sort of elongates the problem even longer that just seems to be the modus operandi at the moment and you are wondering at what stage will it get where they finally lose their rag and they say you know what this we can't carry on uh, like this we at least need to show that we're prepared to try something different yeah. because otherwise we are going to sleepwalk into a disaster of a general election and i mean i suppose this perhaps is why there is some debate within the party about giving the money back they're sitting there on what 18 20 percent and thinking yeah. well what is going to be the hit to our reputation now if we keep this money compared to giving that money back well, for okay. our actual campaign well question is so will most voters notice or care will, will that money be so important to their campaign that actually um, they can't give it back. They've yeah. already spent it. Who are we kidding? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I mean, you were saying, saying Benny, that they should just, they, they believe they're doing the right job. They shouldn't give it back. Mm. At the very least, I would say, don't give it back to the guy, uh, give it to a charity. Yes. Um, but, but, Peter, in terms of, you know, Rishi Sunak being on the back foot right now, mm. how does he get onto the front foot? Because it seems to me like every attempt to like, try and control the agenda yeah. wiped out within an hour of that with some other news breaking. Oh, completely. Um, budget, total failure in terms of appealing to people and people thinking, yes, this is going to be a game changer. They cannot, they sort of cannot get ahead. Mm, absolutely. The post office legislation, for example, yeah. which they thought was going to shift the dial today, it hasn't. The Frank Hester stuff is just going to continue until they have to give the money back or do something, perhaps give it to... Tomorrow uh, is going to have more revelations. Yes, it is, in The yeah. Guardian. Perhaps they're going to have, uh, perhaps they should give it to, and there will be calls to give it to uh, maybe Women's Aid or or some sort of uh, anti-racism charity. But again, if there was just a bit more sort of forthrightness about them, if they were prepared to actually say, no, this is our record on racism and women's yep. rights, and this is what we plan yep. on doing if you elect us, then at least some people might be going to go, ah, oh, well, well, fair enough. Giving the but argument that you gave. Yes, but it's yeah. the fact that they are, they're they still dithering, prevaricating. They're still not able to do that but, either, which shows they don't have any confidence in their own th vision. And that's, that's one of the key things, isn't it? And whether it's sort of dithering or always it should be national insurance, code, should it go up, should it go down? Whether it's about, you know, dealing with you know, the so-called hate marches, are they hate marches, aren't they extremism? Whatever the issue is, I even I was saying like the trans issue and all that, they, they, it, it always seems to have been something that, you know, do we, don't we? They backtrack. And they, oh, what do the focus groups think about this? What do the polls think about this? There's this lack of sort of principle and drive and self-belief and, and people can see. Yes, they can. And you need to be really instinctive. You need to be really decisive. A lot of these arguments, not all of them, but some of them are 5149. And when you're a prime minister, you need to make decisions quickly and decisively. And Rishi stick Sunak, to them. And stick to them. And you don't need all the information. Sometimes there's uncertainty. Sometimes you're going to have to take a risk. That's not who Rishi Sunak is as a person. He'd be an excellent chief executive of a tech company I'm, or maybe a chairman. I'm not sure he has the political instinct. He certainly doesn't have the party management instinct yeah. to get through this. And the thing is that it's beginning to feel more and more like 1996. Rishi Sunak could pledge, you know, a, a puppy and a massage to everybody, and they still wouldn't vote <laughs> Conservatives. I mean, in terms of the options that could, you know, happen in terms of early election, I don't think an early election. I certainly don't. No, think that. agree with I mean, you. Not going to happen in May. That's what we think. The 1922 committee was saying, like MPs are going, do not go yes. uh, early. Um, I'm happy about that, uh, but per for personal reasons, it's the, the date looking at is my birthday. It's the only reason. Purely, <laughs> purely, purely, purely reason. I'm completely selfish. Best well, interests of the being, nation at heart. The interests of the nation at heart. <laughs> my birthday. Are, are you saying um, City Cam being mayor of London for a third term wouldn't be the best birthday present that you would uh, 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 ask for? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> uh, but uh, but the option of you know of, of defecting people. A lot of people are saying that you know. Defected yep. Reform UK um, to try and save some skins, but the other option is is another leadership um, mm -hmm. a, attempt, uh, you know, to another coup. Now, I, more and more people are saying to me behind the scenes that is 
genuinely being discussed. It certainly is, and Lady McAlpine, Judy McAlpine, is behind all this from the Conservative Democratic Organisation. There's a lot uh, of this discussion. It's not going to go away. No, absolutely not. Peter Carwell, thank you very much indeed. More from Benedict Spence as well. Now, we're asking about these failed asylum seekers. You could be paid up to £3,000 of your and my taxpayers' money to encourage them to move to Rwanda. Your reaction? You've managed to keep them clean so far. Well done, everybody. I've managed to keep it clean on air anyway. Uh, you can call 0344 499 text 8722, get in touch on X at Talk TV. Neil says, this is desperation on the part of the UK government. It also rather undermines their claim that Rwanda is perfectly safe. Would you book into a hotel if someone offered you money to go there? Doreen says, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I would. Um, Doreen says, I think they should just be sent there. Why do the taxpayers have to pay them to go? And Paul says, why? Does Rwanda get paid £6,000 for everyone that isn't sent there? I can't see the advantage of this. Some of you have also been getting in touch on the phone. So let's go to Shirley in Kent. Good afternoon to you, Shirley. Oh, hello, Julia. Hello. Lovely your programme. No, well, thank you um, so much. It's better because you're on it. I'm just wondering what planet this government is on. Yeah, there you All go. that money being spent on illegal people that should not be here, we need it to spend on our military. Any old, I'm 87, and I can remember 1939 vaguely when Neville Chamberlain came back and said, peace in our time. And what happened? Within months, we were at war. We're unprepared. We had to borrow money from America for the Marshall Plan yep. and to defeat Hitler. Now, Putin, I feel, is another Hitler. Yep. He's putting troops on the Finnish border. He'd love to get his hands on Europe. And if he happens, we are strapped because we've got no money. We've spent it on these illegal immigrants. Oh, you couldn't go to another country and get put up in a hotel no. and accommodate it. It's ridiculous. I just don't know where this government or any government's coming from. Oh. And I'm not voting again, ever. No, I, I would be saying I want people to vote. Go and spoil your ballot paper. You've probably done your time, though. You say you're to, uh, at, your, at your advanced years. But thank you so much. I think you're expressing uh, the views of an awful lot of people there. Shirley and Kent, thank you very much. Coming up after the break, great news. Children will no longer be prescribed puberty blocking drugs on the NHS in England, thanks to landmark new guidelines. But what about Wales and Scotland? And what about private clinics? We'll talk about that up next. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Hey, Quite hey. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, announced yesterday, children will no longer be prescribed puberty-blocking drugs sorry, on the NHS in England, thanks to landmark new guidelines coming to place at the end of this month. Joining me right now is journalist and teacher, uh, Debbie Hayton. Uh, Debbie, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, now, I have to say, I mean, this has been a long time coming. This announcement comes, it's going to be from the end of this month. It's only NHS England doing that. So, of course, Wales, Scotland, they're going to be able to carry on. And we know that those, uh, uh, the, the governments in those countries, have, uh, in those parts of this country, have, uh, uh, have been rather more in, 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 into this stuff. But we also know that private clinics will still be able to have these drugs. But can we at least welcome this as a start down the road of sanity and morality and evidence-based you know, scientific and medical treatment coming back into fashion? Yes, we should, mate. We should welcome this. It's been a long time coming, though. It's two years since the CAS review uh, started to report, and uh, these issues were consulted on last year. So it's been a long time coming, but we should be pleased at long last that the N NHS England has decided that this is not something that should be routinely prescribed to children. But, as you said, there are worries uh, that still uh, they're still outstanding. Yeah, indeed. And and lots of people who think, oh, for goodness sake, this is only a handful of people. It's not. It used to be a few hundred who were referred to the Tavistock Clinic, which was, you know, the main trans uh, clinic for, for children in this country a few years back. It's now in the thousands. And it's massively changed from being largely boys to being largely teenage girls. Now, that suggests, as a lot of people have thought, there's a lot of, should we say, um, you know, is it um, social contagion that is going on certain schools? It, one group, one, one, one girl uh, goes to this sort of treatment and then suddenly there's an explosion in it. Um, now, there are big concerns about this. You've expressed a lot of concerns about this. Now, you yourself, you are a, a trans-identifying man. You live as a trans woman. You're very, very, very clear, though, that you are still, you're very clear on this, you're still, you know, biologically, you are a man, and that we need to have open debate about this without everyone shouting transphobe at everybody. And yet we know from the cash report, we know from lots of investigations, lots of whistleblowers at the main clinic, the Tavistock in North London, that anyone who spoke out about this, even, you know, a year ago, a few years ago, 20 years ago, this goes back and say, I'm not sure these drugs are good for children. I think the side effects, the long term impact of them, fertility being uh, you know, basically made infertile, um, uh, b losing ability to have any sexual arousal and things like that, that these things affect on brain development, uh, bone density, even there's concerns about liver cancer now, that these drugs are experimental, they are not safe, they have very, very, very many harms, they have questionable benefits, and they should not be being prescribed en masse to troubled children. And yet those people basically were hounded out of their jobs. Yes, it's, it's dreadful. It's appalling. And what's still appalling is the fact that even though the NHS has, uh, has said what they said yesterday, uh, there's still the likely possibility of, of clinical trials. We shouldn't be trialling these drugs. They've, been, they've had long enough to, uh, to, uh, to trial them. Uh, perhaps the Tavistock Clinic should have done some follow-up studies uh, years ago, but they never did that. Then there's the issue of Scotland and Wales, and then there's the issue of private providers, which is my biggest concern of all that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, waiting lists for NHS provision has just, uh, they've just mushroomed and private providers have jumped in to fill that yeah. gap. And there's nothing yesterday which suggests to me that private providers will not be prohibited from filling that gap and uh, providing those drugs to families who can pay. That's the concern and that's my worry. 
Absolutely, and even having even less oversight of it, although I don't think you can have less oversight than we've seen at the Tavistock Clinic. Now, it was the case of Kira Bell, who was a, 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 young, a young woman who believed that she was trans, was put on this road of, of the, the puberty blockers, and, and she had a mastectomy, and that, again, per, you know, basically her body was mutilated, her perfectly healthy body was mutilated um, you know, when she was young. She then brought a, a High Court case, basically saying, you know, I, it was not possible for me to have to have a, you know been able to give consent as a child to to this sort of procedure and these long term impacts she has detransitioned since and like many young women who have gone through this process who are coming forward again and again are saying actually i think the issue was i was actually gay i am gay that is that is the, the, the issue I was struggling with or wasn't aware of. And I was sent down this route that, oh, you think you might be trans because you've seen something on YouTube or a friend has suggested this to you or a doctor suggested it. And then you go down this route. And we've been told in the public that puberty blockers were, there was something that would sort of, you know, stop puberty from developing too much. And therefore it would give children, give teenagers time to make a decision, to see what they wanted. And, and, and that, you know, that it was, a, that what's, the, what's the harm there? But actually, there are huge harms. As I say, brains, you know, uh, development, uh, and, and the fact that they, they had basically become sort of the first step on a sort of a railway road directly to full transitioning, surgery, and their lives being, and bodies irrevocably changed. Well, yes, the report suggested that it was a treadmill. And let's face it, which children want to uh, be put on pause while all their friends go through puberty? The clamour for cross-sex hormones to follow those puberty blockers must have been enormous. And what we saw was reports saying that it was almost a 100% carry-through. So it was never a pause to think. It was the first step on this uh, on this conveyor belt through to uh, cross-sex hormones and then possible infertility and lifelong medical problems. It's shocking. It really is. Uh, we're looking at a service which traditionally has dealt with uh, middle-aged men who wanted to become women and then suddenly this cohort of teenage girls appeared who were perhaps uh, not, uh, not happy about what was expected of them as women and the truth is that these are two completely separate groups yeah. and the travesty is that NHS Gender Services fused the two together and said that it was a single single condition, gender dysphoria. And I think we need to uh, pull that apart and say just what is actually going on here, yeah. because there's a number of possible conditions and what's been what's been happening was not the best way of treating them. No, indeed. And there was, you know, absolute hysteria that greeted anyone who criticised this. You know, whistleblowers, as I say, lost their jobs. Everyone shouts the word transverb about this. And, and then we know, you know, the parents of these troubled children are told if you don't allow them to start on these drugs and go down this route they they're going to they're going to commit suicide because they're so unhappy and actually you know the stats didn't bear that out at all anyway and an awful awful terrible thing to say uh, to a parent of a, of a troubled child but the thing that i find extraordinary is that these drugs you know they are they're saying you know clinical trials now there weren't any proper clinical trials they just started giving these drugs they weren't proven to be safe i mean Parents get told off for giving too much Calpol to their children, for goodness sake, and then they were giving these body-altering, mind-altering, huge uh, you know, therapy drugs to, to, to children without proper, without proper, uh, um, you know, clinical research. They're going to carry on doing that, it would seem. Um, and they didn't, as you say, they didn't look at the long-term impact whatsoever. There wasn't actually a study that carried on, you know. 10 years, 20 years, what happened? How, what, you know, what, what was the reaction? They, 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 they didn't do any follow up on people who detransitioned. I mean, and you can only think they didn't want to know the answers. And why didn't they want to know the answers? Because they knew what they were doing was wrong and they did it anyway. Do you think eventually we will lead to see people going to jail? Do you think, I mean, I've always thought there's going to be massive court cases on this, but do you think that, you know, we need to actually face up that this has been government overlooking it and allowing it to happen, NHS senior figures, doctors doing this. This has actually been mass child abuse and it's gone on publicly under our watch. It has. And what's worse is that people have been calling this out for several years now. It's not, it's not new what's happening this year. People have been calling it out for a while and those people have been ignored. As you said, they've been thrown out of their jobs. They've been written off as transphobes, bigots, all sorts of horrible names has been thrown at people. Uh, looking forwards, the first, the first issue is that this needs to stop. There needs to be no more clinical trials. There's been enough use of these drugs. And if the NHS has not kept proper records of 
happening, then that's their problem. No, no more children need to be harmed at all by this. Uh, looking back at the people who have been involved in this, uh, a number of people are going to have some very hard questions to answer over the next few years. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You've been a, a fantastic uh, uh, spokesperson on, 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 on this uh, issue and speaking out on it. Thank you so much, Debbie Hayton. Still with me is Benedict Spence, last couple of moments of the show. Um, this has been an absolute travesty, what's happened, and it's involved children, and often very troubled children, mm. children on the autism spectrum. Uh, again, particularly, I, I'm really particularly concerned about, you know, young lesbian teenagers who, who just are troubled and think they're in a, in a homophobic family, and then, you know, basically you know, doing horrible things to their bodies. Children who, by definition are vulnerable and amongst them the most vulnerable uh, in that cohort are the ones that have suffered but I can't get particularly sort of animated about this new decision because it's simply a temporary reprieve it can still be you know you think it, it people still can still on. access it in other parts of the United Kingdom and I do really feel that the Labour Party once they come in they will row back in any kind yeah. of pressure and it will become part of what they call the right-wing culture yeah. was, which is yeah, exactly. saying you're a bigot if you don't allow us well to they want conversion there a ban on conversion there to include even saying to someone maybe you're not maybe you're not trans uh, maybe you're gay or, or maybe you're, you're troubled by something else. Yeah. But this is ideological for these people. They're not looking at scientific evidence. But again, neither does the government, as S we know, on many policies. Su such progress had to be made to get to a point where young gay children were not told there's something wrong exactly. with you. And we're back to that position. Now. We absolutely are. Thank you so much, Benedict. It's been an absolute Thank pleasure you. having you on the show today. So much to get through. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. We've covered an awful lot. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin and uh, Alex. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley you are with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl -missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth.